There are those who believe in my innocence and there are those who believe in my guilt. There's no in between. And if I'm guilty, it means that I am the ultimate figure to fear because I'm not the obvious one. But on the other hand, if I'm innocent, it means that everyone's vulnerable and that's everyone's nightmare. Either I'm a psychopath in sheep's clothing or I am you. And that's Amanda Knox speaking in her 2016 Netflix documentary. So what do you think? Is she guilty or is she innocent? Do you remember hearing about Amanda's murder charge and sensational trial, all the wild theories about why she may have killed and forming an opinion about a decade and a half ago? I do. In November of 2007, 21-year-old British exchange student Meredith Kircher was stabbed and suffocated to death in her house in Perugia, Italy. 20-year-old American student Amanda Knox, Meredith's roommate, and Amanda's boyfriend, Raffaele uh, Celestido, and a local man named Rudy Gaudet were the main suspects. Because of the brutal way Meredith was murdered and evidence from the crime scene, police and prosecutors eventually or uh, quickly came to believe that she was killed by multiple people and that she was most likely murdered due to refusing to be in part of some sexual act or perhaps being murdered for scolding and enraged Amanda for being too sexually promiscuous. Uh, that was the tabloid and that was the prosecutorial narrative. Amanda Knox was quickly painted as the ringleader, uh, some sort of alleged and ongoing sexual tryst between herself, uh, Raffaele, and Rudy. Italian prosecutors, police, and tabloids characterized Amanda as a promiscuous man-eater, sex-crazed, a she-devil, and more. There were even allegations that she was uh, some sort of satanic temptress engaged in occult sexual rituals. No allegation was too wild or fantastical, and no allegation seemed to need literally any evidence before it's uh, tossed around. Amanda Knox quickly became one of the most hated women in the world, definitely one of the most hated, probably the most hated woman in Italy. Everything she did and said was scrutinized and exaggerated, especially by the Italian and British press, pointing almost always towards her definite guilt. Amanda's seemingly odd behavior in the days days following, excuse me, Meredith's murder certainly did not help her image, and neither did her early confession that she was in the house when Meredith was murdered. But was she? Or did Amanda and Raffaele collapse under the pressure and uh, possible abuse of an hours-long police interrogation where no attorneys were presented to them? Both of them told different stories over the course of their interrogations and trials. Who was telling the truth? Was anyone telling the truth? Raffaele at one point discredited Amanda's initial alibi, and then Amanda accused her boss, Patrick Lumumba, of murder, but Patrick would provide a solid alibi that directly refuted Amanda's accusation, and then he would be released. This further framed Amanda as a terrible person, a sex-crazed murderer willing to throw anyone under the bus to save her own ass. But did Amanda really try and frame Patrick or did Italian police pressure Amanda into manufacturing a story about Patrick through aggressive interrogation tactics that led to her telling the officers exactly what they wanted to hear? After DNA evidence seemed to have linked all three suspects, Amanda, Raphael, and Rudy to the crime scene, not Patrick, seemed like a closed case. But then Amanda's attorneys and expert witnesses called into question the Italian police's forensic investigation and possible, well, probable evidence contamination. Did they actually even have DNA evidence or was their entire investigation massively flawed from the very beginning? Both Amanda and Raffaele were ultimately acquitted, but only after they'd been convicted twice and spent multiple years in jail. And many people to this day still think they're guilty. This is a fucking wild story, a confusing, convoluted tale. This week, we're going to cover a full timeline of the murder of Meredith Kircher, and the sensational trials that followed, as well as how the media influenced the world's perception of Amanda Knox, how many, many people still feel she's guilty, and many others are convinced she was railroaded by investigative bias and defamatory and inflammatory tabloid coverage in this who the hell is telling the truth, who's lying, who is confused, everyone, and who's simply incompetent, do we finally know with certainty what actually happened to Meredith Kircher the night she was murdered, true crime, crazy-ass trial edition. Of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. The cult of the curious continues. I'm Dan Cummins, the Suck Master, half elf ranger, professional Italian translator, and you are listening to Time Suck. Uh, Another big summer camp announcement. I'll try and keep as short as possible. And real quick, we're going to get into the stories. But hear hear me out on this. Uh, Tickets for the 2023 Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp will go on sale next Monday, January 16th at noon Pacific time. But for the first 48 hours, only for our OG campers from last year. 
If you attended last year, you will be sent a link via email and the link will be posted in the Wet Hot Facebook group. Then on Wednesday, January 18th, also at noon Pacific time, tickets open up to uh, also include all of our Bad Magic patrons. Uh, You will be messaged. Then after another 48 hours, Friday, January 20th at noon Pacific time, tickets open up for everyone. We'll post a link on our socials and then in future episode descriptions. And then ticketing stays open for everyone until camp sells out. Limited tickets are available. A thousand campers is max capacity. Once the cabins fill up, that is it. Also, there's very select, uh, a very select number of private cabin upgrades available. So don't sleep on those if you want one. Unlike last year, you can divide the payment into two chunks, just less than half, do at the time of purchase. The rest uh, you can pay before Jan- uh, June 1st. So you get all the way until June 1st to make the second payment. Camp is going to be fucking epic. And we hope to work with Camp No Counselors for many years to come, making the experience bigger and better. Camp will begin Thursday, September 21st. It'll end Sunday, September 24th. And it'll take place in the Poconos, just outside a little town of Equinox, Pennsylvania, on over 400 gorgeous private acres just for us weirdos. It includes a private lake. We share it with no one. Hiking trails, arts and crafts, a ropes course, big ass heated pool with a rock climbing wall on one side, a yoga studio, private lake again, like I said, at our disposal with, with a boat to pull tubers, numerous bars, modern accommodations with hot showers in every cabin, Wi Fi everywhere a custom app where you can reserve activities, make sure you don't miss marquee events like another scared to death live, a comedy night, or I'll be performing with Chad Daniels for the first time in about a decade. There will be uh, three more awesome comics. We're flying in Kelsey cook, Harry Riley, Doug Mellard tickets are all inclusive covering food, drinks, accommodations, activities, no fucking cots this time. Uh, it's kind of like how a cruise works. You know, you get, you get there. We provide the rest. Camp last year was magical. This one is going to be even better. A million times more organized, more accommodating, more activities. So much room for activities. Uh, and yes, karaoke night will be back and bigger and sillier. There's going to be numerous meet and greets to get a chance to chat it up with Lindsay, myself, Logan, and Tyler also will be there. And uh, starting next week, I'll put the ticket link in the episode descriptions. For now, just look up Camp No Counselors. Check out their New York campsite, even though it's across the border in Pennsylvania. Uh, it is fucking incredible. So there we go. I feel like I should uh, uh, hit some kind of uh, uh, button or something. I don't, maybe this one. I don't know. Doesn't really fit. But it kind of fits because the devil's not going to be there, I don't think. <laughs> but I'm just very excited. And uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, yes, the, the, the new little Chikatilo uh, picture that was on the desk just started sliding. And I had to had to grab him and uh, toss him on the floor. He's, he'll still down on the floor for this uh, week of show. Uh, I will share monthly charity and stand-up tour info next week. Spokane coming up this weekend. Second show on January 15th at the Bing Crosby Theater. Almost totally sold out. And again, more uh, stand-up tour information next week. The last thing for this week, the Art Warlock is as excited about this next merch release as I am about summer camp. Jumping straight into the season of love. Valentine's Day coming up with one of our greatest releases ever. Hitting the shelves this week in an incredible is is an incredible Valentine's card set featuring some of our serial killer dirt bags. Uh, each set includes 16 cards, eight unique illustrated designs on folded three and a half by five inch cardstock. On the front, we've got what Logan calls a 1920s era children's Valentine illustration of each of the following: little uh, Eddie Kemper, Teddy Bundy, Jeffy Dahmer, Johnny Wayne Gacy, Richie Ramirez, little Andre Chikatilo, uh, Davy Berkowitz, and a duo card. Freddie and Rosie West. On the back, uh, you have your to and from lines along with eight unique hearts. So unique, such a unique gift to say the least. You're probably wondering, hey Dan, what about us that don't have close friends or family? Well, not to worry. We also have uh, postcards available as well. Same illustration on the front with a cool Valentine back for easy mailing. If you don't want these in Valentine form or you do, but also want collectible art, we have these designs also on mini canvases. So much cool shit at badmagicmerch.com. Check out that Valentine's collection. And that's it. Sorry for the longer announcement. Uh, Summer camp is just a fucking big deal for us. We're very excited. And we want to do whatever we can to make sure it's a big success. Now time for today's story. In 2007, Amanda Knox was one of about 40,000 students who came to study in Perugia. Uh, Damn, 40,000. That's about how many they get every year or at least around this time it was. Amanda was considered quirky by many, but overall, I think she just looked and acted like a normal college-age girl from Seattle in 2007. 
Uh, Amanda was just beginning to experience a very different kind of attention when she arrived in Italy than she had ever experienced before. She would say in the 2016 Amanda Knox documentary, in Seattle, I was cute. In Italy, I was the beautiful blonde American girl. That I had never been before. Amanda's high school drama teacher told Vanity Fair in 2008, let's lay it out. She wasn't a dazzler. Okay, old drama teacher uh, sounds like a fucking asshole. Wow. But I see what they were saying. Amanda was, for the first time in her life, and this is important for the story, getting all kinds of attention from dudes. She was the, the hot girl. And this image would get blown way the fuck out of proportion during her highly sensationalized trial. Uh, Perugia residents and the Italian media considered Amanda to be extremely beautiful, and her looks for sure impacted the Italian public's perception of her, as did her dating life in Italy. Uh, one newspaper called her Luciferina with the face of an angel. Lucifer, Hail Luciferina? Is that a term for uh, someone who is disciple of our goddess Lucifina or uh, one of Lucifina's sisters or something? After her arrest for murder, media outlets across the world portrayed Amanda in vastly different ways. Tabloids called her Angel Face and Foxy Noxy. That was her MySpace name. Italian and British and other European news outlets characterized her as a sex-obsessed party girl, while American media outlets tended to portray her as a wrongfully accused, hardworking student. Some of the headlines about, uh, about Amanda read, The Dark Angel of Seattle, or Amanda was a drugged-up tart. Uh, she was described as a femme fatale, a dominatrix, a man-eater, so many other uh, similar terms. Are any of these descriptions accurate? Or was she just a very average college girl who had just arrived in a new country where the local men are fucking loving her? And yeah, for a few weeks, she is exploring her sexuality a bit. Uh, I know when girls first really started to notice me when I was in college and I got a little less awkward than I was in high school. Yeah, I went fucking nuts. I slept around and so did many other kids my age. Very, very normal. Uh, the details of Amanda's relationship and sex life, though, were put on the front pages of tabloid after tabloid which is not normal, but of course they were, right? It helped sell ads and make the owners of these tabloids a lot of fucking money. But was this portrayal fair, honest, accurate? No, uh, definitely not. Uh, unfortunately, truth had very little to do with this case in so many ways, as you are about to find out. Uh, the fact that this case occurred in Italy, a very Catholic and still very sexist country, frankly, when it comes to sexuality, uh, did not help Amanda's defense. Italy, still not very progressive. When it comes to sex, uh, which I don't know, for some reason surprised me before I really thought about it for this episode. And it was less so when all this went down. A uh, 2013 European marital poll found that more than one in two Italian men, 55%, admitted to marital infidelity compared to one in three Italian women. Uh, male numbers, the highest in all of Europe. Anecdotally, you can find article after article uh, speaking of Italian men taking mistresses as being a cultural norm. I remember hearing about that from kids who went on this uh, Gonzaga and Florence program many years ago, that the Italian men were uh, very aggressive when it came to flirting, like extremely so, and most of them married, is what uh, a lot of my college friends' experience was. And But that was uh, this norm not acceptable the other way around, right? Being super Roman Catholic, very patriarchal, very much into the Madonna whore complex, it seems, right? Super okay for a dude to fuck around, not at all okay for a woman in the public's eye. Uh, the male counterpart to this case, Raffaele uh, Selecero, he was not demonized in the press in Italy uh, nearly the same way, nearly to the same extent that Amanda was. And that says so much about the culture, right? Of course, he helped Amanda kill. He was chasing his dick around. He couldn't, he couldn't help it. He was a dude easily manipulated into committing evil acts so he could get more of that sweet devil puss. Just a bro being a bro. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, uh, kill an innocent young woman to keep getting their dick sucked. Uh, Amanda Knox was the problem. The loose American woman, the godless whore. That's how she was portrayed. And the girl she supposedly killed, Meredith Kircher, she was portrayed as uh, an angel of sorts. A very good girl, a hardworking, chaste student who was brutally murdered because, you know, probably she refused to participate because of her morals in some kind of debaucherous sexual act allegedly organized by Amanda Knox. Right, Meredith the angel, Amanda the devil. Was that true? Or was Meredith just also a normal college kid? Also fucking around with dudes, partying a bit? Was the whole narrative around this trial completely manufactured by the press and by investigators who might as well have just worked for the tabloids directly? Italian media outlets made it seem as though just because Amanda liked to have sex, that automatically made her capable of murder. 
and capable of manipulating stupid, sex-hungry dudes into doing her murderous bidding. Amanda's sexuality, she was found to have had, oh my gosh, seven sexual partners in her lifetime. When her diary was still at seriously seven. Uh, that was seen as like evidence, you know, this dark, evil side of her personality. Seven partners seems pretty fucking normal to me for someone who's 20. And for a sex-crazed vixen, it honestly seems very low. Uh, Lucifina's laughing her ass off at any Italians judging Amanda for having a, a sex life back when all this went on. Amanda was eventually exonerated, but she is still dealing to this day with the aftermath of her character assassination. The New York Times wrote in 2021, while her legal purgatory may be over, a kind of cultural purgatory remains. How do you move forward when the tiniest details of your life can spur a tabloid frenzy? How do you get a, quote, regular job when your name overshadows everything you do? How do you grapple with using that name to build a life or an identity or a career when there is a dead woman whose tragic story is dredged up every time you speak? Ms. Knox became a kind of vessel onto which society could project its fears and judgments, as well as its pornographic fantasies. Ms. Knox was perceived as an unsophisticated American, loud and flamboyant, ignorant of Italian culture, an exhibitionist and slob who brought strange men to the house. She was a sexual deviant who competed with her mother for attention as the tabloid suggested. She was a Karen who had accused an innocent black man of the crime. As you'll see in this case, it seems like people cared more about Amanda's sex life and other details of her life, you know, the alleged wild group orgies she orchestrated, than actual physical evidence against her and Raffaele Selecito. And Rudy Gaudet, the man whose murder conviction regarding Meredith actually stuck, the man who there was so much physical fucking evidence for, uh, his part in this legal drama was pushed to the background in favor of analyzing Amanda and Raphael's relationship and mostly just analyzing Amanda. Uh, this was not only unfair to Amanda's case, also unfair to Meredith. Meredith, the murder victim, also became a background figure in her own murder case. So how did all this happen? Many elements of the case combined to make it a perfect tabloid material. Two young, beautiful girls studying abroad, one American, one British, the mystery of Meredith's murder in a locked room, Amanda's supposed promiscuity and strange behavior after the murder, and the alleged orgy that no one has ever really been able to describe, and that story just kept morphing and changing cartoonishly. Ugh. Today, we'll cover a timeline from beginning to end of how Amanda got to Italy, what her brief time studying abroad was like, the murder of Meredith Kircher, and the years, uh, long trials and acquittal that followed. By the end, kind of like with our Scott and Lacey Peterson suck and our Casey Anthony and OJ sucks, these other trial sucks, uh, will you think she was fairly imprisoned for a murder she did commit and then unfairly released? Or was she unjustly imprisoned for a murder she had nothing to do with? I will say that for me, my opinion regarding Amanda Knox's guilt or innocence drastically changed, completely changed as I dug into the research. Uh, what I thought going in was not what I thought coming out. I felt bad by the end of my research, honestly. I thought based on what I remembered of her trial, based on internet comments, based on my own gut feeling, just seeing her in interviews, that she was for sure guilty, that she got away with murder. And now I truly think the exact opposite. Uh, I feel sorry for her. I feel like she was really fucked over by a terrible and borderline completely incompetent Italian judicial system. And, uh, you know, by a fucking pack of morally bankrupt tabloid fucking hyena journalists. So remember what you're thinking now, Meat Sack. See how it compares to what you'll be thinking in a few hours uh, or, you know, a few hours of podcasting later. And let's jump on into all of this with this week's Time Suck Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck Timeline. Amanda Marie Knox was born on July 9th, 1987. Uh, being so sex-crazed right from the start, uh, she was wearing a G-string bikini when she came out of the womb and was fully developed. She was drunk. She, mandated, she demanded a ticket to Cabo to go party and, quote, suck all the dicks in Mexico. Wow. Crazy. No, uh, no she was uh, just a normal, uh, dumb, sexless baby who, like all babies, never did anything impressive. Amanda's parents are Etta Mellis and Kurt Knox. Etta worked as a math teacher in Kurt Knox while he would go on to become vice president of finance for Macy's in Seattle when his daughter was implicated in murder, was working as a capital control manager for a division of allied department stores when Amanda was born and had graduated just a few years prior from Eastern Washington University in Cheney with a degree in accounting 
Uh, this uh, university is only about an hour's drive from where I sit here in the Suck Dungeon. Uh, Edda was born in Germany. Her mom coming to America at the age of six after her uh, Amanda's grandma fell in love with an American soldier. After getting her teaching certificate, the college she attended is uh, not listed in sources. She meets Kurt. They fall in love. They get married, have Amanda. Two years later, uh, she gets pregnant with Deanna. Uh, Amanda has three sisters. She has two half-sisters named Ashley and Delaney from her father's marriage to his second wife, Cassandra. Uh, Amanda's mom will go on to marry a man named Chris. Uh, Chris, an IT worker, settled into family life, taught Amanda how to play the guitar, and became a model stepfather. Backing up to 1989, Amanda's parents got divorced when she's not quite two years old. Mom pregnant with Amanda's sister, Deanna, at the time. And Amanda will go on to split her time between her parents' uh, houses. Uh, yeah, her parents' houses. Her parents rarely would speak to each other, you know, after they separate, pretty normal. But they did purchase houses just two blocks apart so that their daughters didn't have to travel far to visit either parent. Uh, Amanda will grow up in the Arbor Heights neighborhood of West Seattle. She lived near Seattle Prep, described to one source as a highly competitive Jesuit school filled with children of wealthy Catholics. I know some people who went to Seattle Prep because I went to Gonzaga. Uh, Amanda wanted to attend school here and even received a partial scholarship to go. She was a good student. Her mom later told Vanity Fair, yeah, there were a lot of rich kids. You know, she found her niche, but that was uh, definitely not her social network at all. Amanda did get involved in the theater there and did well, despite having a fucking asshole, as we learned earlier, for a teacher. Uh, She got roles in Annie and The Sound of Music. Amanda's old friend, Sean Glenn, told Vanity Fair that they used to sing in the hallways and people were annoyed by it, but Amanda didn't seem to mind. So, you know, she's a bit of a weirdo, bit of a theater dork. Not exactly a uh, villainous archetype. Glenn said she's not crazy and she's not stupid. She phrases things as though she doesn't have a full grasp of reality. Her thoughts get muddled. After watching a lot of interviews of Amanda, I get what Glenn is saying here. She does. She seems very smart and also, you know, quirky, spacey, bit of an odd duck, maybe a bit dramatic uh, when she was younger in interviews, especially. But again, very smart. Uh, Amanda studied hard in school, made the dean's list. She played on the school soccer team. And her nick- teammates would nickname her Foxy Noxy. You know, just whatever, silly high school nickname. Uh, this would later become her MySpace username and then an unfortunate tabloid headline that would, in many people's minds, epitomize who she was. The sex crazed deviant. 2005, Amanda graduates high school. She'd been accepted to and now goes to attend the University of Washington, Seattle as a linguistic student. During her freshman year of college, Amanda realized that she had a talent for language and thought about becoming a translator or a writer. Considered studying abroad in Germany, but decided she wanted to go to Italy instead. Wonder how many times she would later think, really fucking should have went to Germany. Uh, Amanda had been fascinated by Italian culture since she'd studied Latin and Roman history in middle school. When she was 14, she spent two weeks in Italy with her mom and family. And by the time she returned home, she was maybe almost as fluent in Italian as I am. Did you know actually that I speak perfect Italian? A ciao bella! Eh, San Antonio Riccatoni Ferrari! Eh, hey, it's a Gucci Maserati pizzeria. That's a spice of meatball. Uh, Mamma mia. I know it was you, Fredo. Fucking nailed it. Masterclass. Now, if you don't speak Italian, I just said uh, that I'm very excited about today's episode and I hope you're all having fun and, you know, learning about this and God bless. Uh, anyway, Amanda was so excited to live it up in Italy that she worked three jobs to save up for studying abroad in Italy her junior year. She was pumped to study abroad to really explore life in Europe and find herself. Italy would be her first time, you know, living outside of Seattle, outside of the Seattle area and away from her fam- family. And how exciting. Uh, and I relate somewhat. My junior year, after also working three jobs to save up money, I was able to study abroad for a semester in London. Uh, one of the most formative experiences of my life. So much fun. I only, I only knew one other person uh, when I got there, another kid from Gonzaga who I barely knew and really didn't keep in touch with much afterwards. Uh, an experience like this, leaving most of what you know, leaving everyone who knows you, on the other side of the world, it really just allows you the opportunity to re-examine who you are, learn about yourself, take new chances uh, without worrying about what, you know, old friends are thinking and, you know, maybe old family judging you for it. And I did that. I really came into my own that semester, learned I could live wherever, really was introduced to the arts that uh, clearly have resonated with me to this day. You know, I was not exposed to the theater and performances and stuff much before that. Uh, Amanda experimented as well, really spread her wings back in Seattle, where she had, again, always lived. She was a cute and quirky theater kid. She was pretty average, honestly, uh, kind of a dork, it seems. But in Italy, new and exciting and exotic. Uh, She was gorgeous, 
right? And she seemed to take on this new identity. Uh, and she was still getting used to this new identity of being kind of the, the it girl, you know, still playing around with this uh, new costume of sorts when all hell broke loose. Amanda said in that 2016 documentary about her that she knew that she was quirky and different, but hadn't really gotten the chance to express that prior to Italy. When she started college, she felt behind her peers in terms of life experience and wanted an, ex- an experience where she had to depend on herself, get outside of her comfort zone. She thought studying abroad would help uh, turn her into an adult. Man, did it fucking ever in ways she could have never anticipated. On September 20th, 2007, Amanda arrives in Perugia, uh, moves into a house there. She'd been, uh, you know, she'd be studying at the University for Foreigners, a language school in the city in just a couple days. Uh, Perugia, I was not familiar with this scenic historical city before this week. Uh, it is gorgeous. Uh, of course it is. I have yet to see a picture of an Italian city that is not gorgeous. Perugia, the capital city of Umbria, a region in central Italy, located in between Rome and the powerful microstate of Dan Marino, fucking cannon for an arm. Sorry, I mean San Marino. Uh, could have also said about halfway between Rome and Florence, roughly 100 miles north of Rome, 90 miles south of Florence. And it's a big college town, an old one. About 168,000 people live there and around 40,000 of them college students. Around 34,000 attend the University of Perugia, founded in 1308. Another 5,000 attend the University of Foreigners. And there's some, you know, pretty small institutions scattered around as well, such as the Perugia University Institute of Linguistic Meditation for people studying to become translators or interpreters and the Music Conservatory of Perugia, uh, you know, and this, uh, all in this city founded sometime in the 4th century BCE over 2,500 years ago. Uh, altogether, around 40,000 college kids and, uh, and I just messed up my mouth. Oh, it was, it, no, it was over uh, 2,300 years ago. I did some stupid math and i glad I caught myself before uh, somebody else caught me. Um, yeah, Perugia, originally settled by the Umbrians, a group of ancient Italians. Its first written name was Perugia. Perugia, once uh, part of a, it's a different spelling, like P-R- P-E-R-U-S-I-A was the old name. Now it's P-E-R-U-G-I-A. So it's always been called the same thing. Uh, once part of the Roman Empire, uh, whoever those guys are, I've never heard of them. I think they might be the guys with the funny mohawk helmets or something. Uh, kidding if you're new. Of course, I have heard of the Romans. Uh, the city still has walls and arches from the time of the Romans. It has medieval aqueducts, a Renaissance era fortress, so many other historical sites, like many places in Italy. Uh, Roman emperor, pope, poets, philosophers, famous Renaissance painters such as Pietro Perugino. Fucking nailed it because I'm fluent. Uh, Raphael's mentor and a master in his own right. The Ascension of Christ painting he did, it's a fucking masterpiece. And uh, more have been born in Perugia. It's been a city of education, a city of art, and a city of chocolate. Seriously, today, uh, Perugia is mostly known for chocolate. Or as they say in Italian, a Guido Castagna Baratti Milano, Ferrari Francesca Risa's a piece, of, that's a spice and meatball. Fucking nailed it, masterclass. Uh, I just said in Italian, they have a lot of delicious chocolate in Perugia, and I think that's really great. Uh, the Perugia Chocolate Company was founded, uh, excuse me, Perugina. The Perugina, the Perugina Chocolate Company uh, was founded in 1907, 1988, Nestle purchased it. And Perugina's most well-known product is their hazelnut-filled chocolate kisses, which sound delicious. Uh, Bacci Perugina. Uh, super popular in Italy and elsewhere in Europe, not so much here in the States, which is a bummer. But I'm sure I could find it if I looked. Uh, Perugia has hosted the annual Euro Chocolate Festival since 1993, one of the largest chocolate festivals in Europe. I never even really thought that the chocolate festival was a thing, but uh, fucking million people come to this thing every year. They're not fucking around with their chocolate. This festival lasts for nine days. Visitors can see chocolate art, watch elaborate chocolate sculpting, uh, add several inches to their waistline in less than two weeks, and if they really you know, indulge themselves fully, uh, push their stomachs to the point of detaching from the rest of their organs. Or go from being completely healthy to having some of their limbs removed due to advanced diabetes. Uh, I love chocolate. Love it. Devil's food cake. Hot fudge brownie sundaes. Dark chocolate bars filled with cashews or coconut or almonds or some other kind of nut. Peanut butter, M&M's, chocolate malts. But a chocolate festival for nine days. Seems a bit much. Uh, 21-year-old Meredith Kircher, not sure what her feelings on chocolate were had been living in the house Amanda had just moved into since August of 2007, so just the month before Amanda moved in. Uh, Two Italian women named Filomena and Laura, also living there, also the same age, roughly, and then uh, four male students, about the same age, living in the apartment below them. So fuck yeah! Nice! 
Uh, the house was located in what was described in uh, some sources as a bad neighborhood because of some drug activity at the nearby basketball court. Oh, no! Not drugs! Gosh dang! Bad guys playing basketball and selling drugs? Like marijuana and cocaine? Who could live ch- near such horrors? Uh, watching a variety of travel videos on Perugia, get the fuck out of here. It does not have a truly bad neighborhood. Not by U.S. standards. No neighborhood full of a lot of gang violence, drive-by shootings, a bunch of carjackings, break-ins. Uh, yeah, they have like literally all cities, a part of town where the rent's uh, a little bit less because some of the homes are a little more beat up and you know the poorest people in town live there and sometimes largely in crimes of desperation. They steal shit or try to steal shit, some of them, and sometimes in the process of stealing or trying to steal shit, people get hurt. Sometimes people die. Of course, like in any you know bigger population area, not that this place is even that big, there are some sexual crimes as well. It looks like a very safe place to live, actually. Uh, Now that we've just met Meredith in this timeline, let's take a second to get to know her because a major complaint of her family and from many people in the comment sections of various docs and interviews I watched about her murder is that her character gets pretty lost in her own story. Uh, Nearly all the media attention around her death was focused on one suspect, Amanda Knox. And most people following the story of her murder ended up knowing so little about Meredith. And then the narrative about who, uh, you know, she was studious, not sex crazed like Amanda uh, reduced her to some trope that based on reading more in-depth pieces about her, and there's a lot of stuff, but there's a little bit of stuff. Uh, it doesn't seem to define her more than Amanda's sex crazed depictions define her. The tabloids in Italy were preposterously sensational in their coverage of this case. And frankly, just did a lot of shitty reporting like bad screenwriters. They made all the characters in this story very wooden, very one dimensional, one note, predictable stereotypes instead of nuanced living and breathing individuals. Uh, Born on December 28th, 1985 in uh, Southwark, I think I'm saying it right, spelled Southwark, but I saw people getting mocked in comment sections for saying Southwark, Uh, Southwark, London, Uh, Meredith Susanna Kara Kircher, known as Mez to her friends, was a year and a half older than Amanda, and she saw her time in Italy, like Amanda, as a dream trip, dream come true, chance to uh, explore her, you know, who she was. Her parents said she was very excited about learning the language, meeting new friends, and fully immersing herself in a different culture. Kircher chose the central Italian city for her exchange trip over Milan and Rome, where she could have also gone, because ironically, she believed it would be safer. Uh, Her father, John, said she fought so hard to get there. Uh, She'd fallen in love with Italy when she was 14 in 2000, when she spent her summer vacation with the family in Sessa Aranca, Caserta Campania, Italy, Italia. Uh, But yeah, it's a little town. Uh, She was the youngest daughter of John and Arlene Kircher and sister to John Jr., Lyle and Stephanie. The family resided resided in Coulson, uh, part of Greater London, England, on the very southern edge of London's greater metro area. And she is consistently described by friends and family and reporters as being both witty and beautiful, kind with a sharp mind, possessing a great sense of style, a dazzling smile, described in an obituary as an exotic beauty who blended the best of Anglo-Saxon and Indian cultures. She attended the private school, uh, Old Palace of John Whitgift in Croydon, Greater London. An all-girls school where students, uh, you know, from ages of three all the way to 18 can study. And it costs on average, or did at the time she went there, 10,000 pounds a year. Established in 1889, operating out of buildings to go back to the 12th century, it is consistently ranked as one of the top independent girls' schools in all of London. Following her graduation, she attended Leeds University in Leeds, West Yorkshire, not Shire, England, where she was working towards a degree in European studies and wanted to be a teacher. Uh, While in Leeds in 2004, when Meredith was 18, she appeared as the object of the lead singer's romantic interest in a music video that you can watch if you want on YouTube right now. The official music video for British pop artist Christian Leontius, uh, Some Say. I'd play a bit, but I, I don't really like it. And Meredith is not singing it. And I'm not sure Christian is still making music, but pretty random trivia and shows that she had a sexual side, which the tablets acted like she didn't. Uh, In Perugia, she was studying political theory, modern history, the history of cinema. She was said to be a dedicated student, but she didn't always have her nose in a book. Not at all. Again, like the tabloids tried to portray. According to her father, she went to uh, ballet and in her teens did karate, reaching her third belt. At school, she loved reading. She wrote poetry and stories. She was always good company and her sense of humor always had us and others laughing. The sense of the ridiculous stayed with her. She had such life and vitality and made friends wherever she went. Meredith really enjoyed Halloween as a youngster. She would make a costume from bin liners, 
you know, garbage, garbage bags, uh, put candles in the pumpkins with faces, tie them to sticks, and then we would visit neighbors. It is ironic and tragic that she would die so terribly only one day after Halloween. Uh, she's been described as sweet and shy, sociable and loving. Unfortunately, not a lot of info out there about her other than that. Doesn't seem like the press cared to really know anymore or the public really. Everyone wanted to know more about Amanda. Amanda thought her language classes were going to be a lot more challenging than they were when she got there. And flush with free time, she quickly decided after starting school to try and get a part-time job. And she did. She met Patrick Lumumba, owner of Le Chic. Uh, Lumumba, originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he's a definitely a character in the story. According to Amanda, Patrick hired her basically because she was uh, hot. You know, young, hot, blonde girl from, uh, with a bubbly personality from America. And he hoped that she would bring in extra customers and keep them coming back. All right. Sounds like a good business move. Uh, Lumumba told Vanity Fair she spent most of her time chatting up the guys and flirting. Uh, the house Amanda. But he, again, she just got there. <laughs> she just arrived in Italy. She's getting attention. And yeah. And she's, you know, she's working at a, a, a cafe. Of course, he's going to flirt. The house Amanda and Meredith lived in was described in some other sources as not being in a bad part of town, but being a, a great location. I, I believe these sources overlooking the rolling hills and close to the university for foreigners. Uh, Amanda loved being in Italy. She wrote to her friends and family. I am actually at one of my most happiest places right now. Right. Writes that shortly after getting there. Amanda was having fun meeting new people, uh, but her roommates supposedly, according to tabloids in later interviews, thought she might've been meeting too many people. Uh, Meredith told her father, John Kircher, Amanda arrived only a week ago and she already has a boyfriend. Oh my, how scandalous. Uh, Meredith told her friends that Amanda had several boyfriends in quick succession. She also, boyfriends? Or was she just hooking up? Uh, she also allegedly was angry with Amanda over some rent dispute and Amanda's cleanliness. Uh, you know, Amanda will dispute this later. So maybe that happened. Might just be tabloid fodder. Also, according to tabloids, Meredith's friends weren't the biggest fans of Amanda. Uh, one friend allegedly later told police, first time I met her, we were eating in a restaurant when all of a sudden she began to sing in a loud voice. It was very strange and out of place. And again, I just think, yeah, theater dork. Uh, but also, Amanda and Meredith did have some similarities. They were both daughters of divorced parents. They both liked to drink at local pubs. They did party together, had fun together several times. Uh, often, in fact, more than several, despite the Italian media trying to paint uh, you know, her as uh, some virginal and pious Madonna who spent all her time studying and was just not wild at all about boys. That is not true about Meredith. Yes, Amanda and Meredith may have had a few arguments about living together, but also, again, had fun. They went out to grab drinks together, uh, visited male students numerous times who lived below them to party, had those students and other people up in their place to party. They were both totally normal college kids in many respects. You know, they had a guest come over, play guitar, smoke weed, that kind of shit. And of course they did. You know, they're at the very beginning of their 20s, living together in fucking Italy near bars, surrounded by thousands and thousands of college kids, a bunch of dudes who think they're hot as fuck, and they're nowhere near their families. It'd be weird for two straight college girls to not have friends over to drink, smoke some weed, play some fucking music. It'd be weird if they didn't chase a few boys around. Uh, one of the guests they had over, according to some sources, was Rudy Gaudet, 20 year old man described as both tall and painfully skinny, painfully skinny. Uh, so, you know, sa same age as them. Rudy, a uh, big character in the story, a double citizen of Italy and the Ivory Coast. He moved to Italy with his parents at the age of five, loved playing basketball. Growing up, he, uh, like a lot of kids, you know, would skip school, play some video games, also maybe loved weed more than the average person. Uh, Rudy was, according to one article, known for occasionally smoking weed until he lost consciousness. All right. Had a difficult relationship with his dad, who had decided to eventually return to the Ivory Coast, for forcing, excuse me, G'day to rely on social services to get by, maybe kind of nudging him towards a, a life of some crime, because he did have a criminal record for theft and drug possession by the time he enters the story. Had a little habit of breaking into places. Uh, and this is a very important detail that gets overlooked by both the press and the prosecution in the aftermath of Meredith's murder. Numerous locals would identify Rudy as the man they had seen break into their home or business after his picture was plastered across a bunch of tabloid covers. Also, I think this is very important. On October 27th, 2007, just a few days before Meredith's murder, a principal at a nursery school in Milan said she found a strange figure coming out of her office and that man was identified as Rudy Gaudet. When police arrived at the scene and asked him to open his backpack, they found a 40 centimeter kitchen knife, which he had taken from the kitchen nursery. Uh, another important detail. Why the fuck did he take a knife and was uh, keeping it in his backpack? Also found a small hammer, keys, a watch. By the time Gaudet was charged with possession of stolen goods, he was already in custody for Meredith's murder. 
Uh, G'day was said, uh, in, or has said, excuse me, in, in more recent years that he did not have a criminal record before Meredith's murder, but based on analyzing a lot of sources, that is not true. He is full of shit. Uh, Rudy claimed he met Meredith October in, in October of 2007, right, right after she uh, arrives from England, and that he was immediately attracted to her. There are so many lies in this story, but this one seems not to be a lie, seems to be true. One of the men who lived in the basement flat below Knox and Kircher's apartment, uh, Giac- Giacomo Salenze, had known Rudy Gaudet since the year before Kircher's death. He said he met Gaudet while playing basketball on the court above the apartment building. It's kind of built on a hill. And Gaudet had supposedly been to Salenze's apartment on several occasions when both Knox and Meredith were present. And a court document would read, it appears that Gaudet was attracted to Knox, who on their first meeting was single and unattached. And then Gaudet seems to have quickly moved on to Meredith after Amanda started dating someone else. Uh, it's moved on as far as, you know, flirting with, with her, maybe had a relationship with her. It's very disputed. Uh, Gaudet reportedly met Kircher about three or four times before her death, uh, supposedly kissing her the night before she was murdered, according to Salenzi, according to what uh, Gaudet said to Salenzi. And according to court documents, Kircher may have invited Gaudet over to her place the night she was killed, and he happily agreed to come to her apartment. That's what Rudy would say later. Uh, but I do not believe him. Uh, we'll hear more from him later that I think will explain why I don't believe him. Just again, so many lies in the story. On October 25th, 2007, just a week before Meredith's murder, now Amanda Knox meets 23-year-old uh, Raffaele Selecito, an Italian computer science student. But I want to say his name again. And, you know, if I was in Italy, i will be like, oh, Raffaele Selecito. That's, <laughs> that's how I talk. On the many occasions, you know, I spend time there to make sure I stay fluent. Uh, the son of a successful urologist, uh, Selecito, was born on March 26, 1984, in the little town of Giovanazzo, just outside the southern Italian city of Bari. Uh, about 350,000 live in this uh, city, in the city limits. About 750,000 live in the metro area. That uh, is a little over 330 miles from Perugia. A tribe of Greeks inhabited the area over 7,500 years ago, and then the city became a part of the Roman Empire in the 3rd century BCE, an important fishing port. Decent amount of fishing still done in the area. A lot of ferries, a lot of cruise ships arrive and leave the city daily. Like pretty much all Italian cities, has a ton of historical sites going back literally thousands of years. And anyway, uh, Raffaele was just uh, months away from completing his degree in computer science when he meets Amanda. Amanda described him as an Italian Harry Potter. Uh, Many others described him as tense and anxious. He does seem tense and anxious in interviews, actually. Also, I get the Harry Potter resemblance uh, and seems very kind and sweet. Uh, also described as being very romantically inexperienced. A uh, prosecutor in the case said that, and I'm assuming this was discovered during some interrogations. And uh, supposedly he had maybe been with two women total prior to Amanda. And this was, you know, used and blown up in the tabloids. That's how, that's how you know, wh- how she was able to really, you know, hook him in because he was just very sexy and experienced. And then this, you know, promiscuous vixen just had him bent around her finger. Uh, Raffaele described himself as being more interested in video games than girls growing up. Uh, he was shy, socially reclusive, overweight as a kid. Now he's also kind of coming into a new identity. He's getting uh, romantic attention, uh, this time from a you know very beautiful American woman. He's overjoyed. Amanda met Raffaele at a classical music concert. Nerds! Uh, and they quickly began a relationship. Raffaele said in the 2016 Amanda Knox documentary, I went to a classical music concert and there was this girl alone. She was very, very pretty. When I looked at her, she looked at me back. I was so shy that even if she looked at me, she smiled at me. I was turning back and said, is she looking at somebody in my back? It was not. It was me. So after I realized it, I said, why not talking? And I do apologize for him not being as good in English as I am as good in Italian. But not everyone everyone is, you know, uh, fluent in other languages like I am. Uh, Raffaele took Amanda to a quiet place with a beautiful view of the city later that night. Very romantic place. And that's where they kissed for the first time and began to date. Amanda thought Raffaele was cute, sweet, uh, more romantic than any other guy she'd ever been with. And this was her first time, she would say, really falling in love. And for the next week, they spent as much time together as they possibly could. They explored the city, took pictures together, smoked weed, drank, had a lot of sex. Hail Lucifina. Uh, they were doing college the way you're supposed to. November 1st, 2007. This is the last normal day Amanda, to- Amanda Knox and Raffaele Selecito we'll get to have together. Also, Meredith Kircher's last day alive. Sadly, Meredith was planning to go home in the next few weeks to visit her family for her mom's birthday. Uh, Raffaele and Amanda later both said that they saw Meredith in the kitchen at 4 p.m. and that she left the house to meet some friends for pizza and ice cream. She then left her friends at 9 p.m., told them she was tired, heading back home. 
Amanda initially told investigators that she spent the entire night of November 1st with Raffaele. And she'd uh, circle back to the story after uh, a bit of a detour we'll get into in a bit. Uh, she said that they watched a movie at Raffaele's place, read Harry Potter, smoked weed, had sex. Amanda received a text from her boss, Patrick, while she was uh, watching a movie uh, that she didn't have to come into work. So she stayed the entire night with Raffaele. Uh, she would text her boss back, sure, see you later. Or at least she claims she wrote that. A translation of what she wrote will come back to haunt her. Also during a later interrogation, uh, Raffaele will say that he couldn't be sure that Amanda was with him the whole night. He'll go back on his initial story. And again, more on all that in just a bit. Uh, things get very messy very quickly in this investigation. The sloppiest investigation that I've covered so far. Uh, 21-year-old Meredith Kircher is found dead in her bedroom early on November 2nd, 2007. And the following account of the events that occurred next come from Amanda. She said she came home from Raffaele's, saw the front door open. She thought this was strange, but not terribly alarming. You know, usually is locked. She figured one of her roommates just didn't lock the door properly. Nothing was out of place that she saw in the common room or her bedroom. Uh, but then she did see that, you know, see that Meredith's door was shut. Next, Amanda quickly noticed two pea-sized flecks of, uh, flecks of blood, excuse me, in the sink of the bathroom that she shared with Meredith. Uh, there was also a blood smear on the faucet. The blood was dry, like it had been there a while. Uh, Amanda now, and this is a little weird to me, uh, rather than check on Meredith, she takes a shower. And I just say like a little weird because, you know, she didn't find blood all over the place. She found a, you know, pea-sized flecks of blood uh, in the sink, dried smear on the faucet, you know, in a college house. When I was 20, I also would have checked on fucking no one after seeing that. I would have assumed it was probably my blood when I was drunk. I was fucking blackout drunk or blood from a roommate's cut or nosebleed or whatever. And that no one cleaned it up because we were filthy animals. Uh, constantly getting drunk and high, not taking care of things. And actually, this is a, a, a this jogged a memory. I did come home once to find blood around the sink. And it was because a roommate of mine did have a bloody nose the night before when they were just hammered and did not bother to clean it up because we were dirtbags. And I, and I didn't, I don't remember checking on anybody. Uh, when Amanda got out of the shower, she said that she now noticed a larger spot of blood on the bath mat. Amanda thought that this might be period blood, but that didn't explain the blood in the sink. She is like, what is going on? But again, filthy college kids living in what sounds uh, like a bit of a party house. She thinks that maybe Meredith hurt herself and then forgot to clean up. Amanda now goes into a roommate's uh, bathroom to use her hair dryer. This is when she looks into the toilet and sees a big old shit in there. And it hadn't been flushed. Source said feces, but come on, she saw turd. And that frightened Amanda, which is interesting to me. This might illustrate the difference between young men and young uh, women, I guess. In my experience, women are more disturbed by unflushed toilets than men. Seeing a turd would not freak me out. It would annoy me. But again, I would just figure that someone was drunk and, you know, forgot to flush it. I just fucking move on with my life and not even think anything of it. You know, I knew I lived with other dirtbags. But Amanda lived with all girls. Some blood, not a big deal. Giant turd. Well, it's a red flag. Not all is right in the house. And I don't actually know for certain that it was a big turd. Or even actually a turd. Might have been diarrhea. But my gut says turd. It says big old man turd, fucking big old brown snake coiled up, ready to strike. As they say in Italian, Benevento, Napoli, Ragù, Carabana, Mamma Mia, Agostino, Bologna, Poopy, and the Bagno, it's a stinky meatball. Fucking masterclass. <laughs> in English, that translates to no one likes a stinky poopy left in a toilet for anyone to savor. Anyway, now, Amanda said that she knew something wasn't right. The unlocked door, a little bit of blood, a lot of bit of turd. So now she decides to go get Raffaele. Amanda called her mom first. Then she called her roommate, Philomena. Philomena had spent the night at someone else's house. Another roommate, Laura, uh, was away in Rome. Amanda tried calling Meredith's British phone, then her Italian phone. Doesn't receive an answer on either one. Uh, Amanda goes back to Raffaele's house now, tells him uh, what's going on. Then they eat breakfast together, then go back to the house. That does seem a bit weird to me. If they're worried, why, why go to the house quicker? But whatever. Uh, and why not call the police? You know, Tell them someone might have broken in. But there was a little blood. Can't find Meredith. The door's locked. Not answering her phone. But instead, she goes and grabs some breakfast before coming back to investigate all this further. Uh, Raffaele said in the 2016 documentary, I went back there. I saw all this mess. It was very weird. And I was a little bit surprised that she took a shower inside her house without having the anxiety of it. Yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. It is a little odd. Doing a bit of exploring now, Amanda and Raffaele say that they find a broken window in Filomena's room. Uh, saying the window had been shattered and glass was everywhere. Clothes were heaped all over the bed and floor. The drawers and cabinets were open. All I could see was chaos. Meredith's door still shut. They now knock gently on Meredith's door, call out to her. Why didn't Amanda do that before? You know, after calling Meredith's numbers, 
maybe she did. It just wasn't written down in sources. Uh, do not receive a response. They knock louder. They yell. No response still. Raffaele now tries to kick in the door, but can't do it. Bigger, thicker door. So they decide it's best to call the police. It looks like someone's broken in. And then the following is a translation of Raffaele's two calls to the police. So first call, you know, the police are, uh, answer it with saying, uh, Carabinieri. Uh, Raffaele says, uh, hello, good day. Listen, someone has entered the house, breaking the window and has made a big mess. And there was a closed door. The street is, uh, and then, uh, they ask like, what's the street in the background? Uh, Via della Pergola. Uh, like Raffaele is asking somebody in the background, Hey, what's the street? Uh, and then, um, yeah. And then, uh, Raffaele says Via della Pergola seven police via Raffaele della Pergola seven in Perugia. Uh, police residents of Mr. Question mark. Uh, Raffaele says, mm, Amanda Knox, <laughs> police officer, eh? Uh, Raffaele, the, who lives here is, they are a group of students among which there is Amanda Knox. Please give me the name and mobile number of one of the tenants. Raffaele spells out Amanda's name, gives her phone number. Uh, the police ask, theft, burglary in the house, eh? Raffaele says, no, there's no theft. They broke a window. There is a mess. There is also a closed door, a mess. Please say just a moment, please. Some music plays. The police come back on. Hello, Raffaele. Yes, police. So listen, they entered. They broke a window. How do you know they entered? Raffaele says it can, see, it can be seen by the signs. There are drops. There are blood stains in the bathroom. They say, so they entered because the window's broken. Did they cut themselves breaking the window? Raffaele, mm, this, and then the call drops. Hello? All right, second call now. Please answer. It's me, Mario. Pasha Ferrari, Cupa Troopa. Uh, keep order and uh, look out for Wario. Uh, grazie. Uh, uh, salute Antonio Banderas, Tony Soprano. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All I want to do is continue to speak perfect time right now. But I know I should focus on the story. No, <laughs> I wish the police said that. What they said is, uh, Carbonetti, <laughs> Borussia. Raffaele's like, hello. Yeah, I called two seconds ago. And they're like, someone has entered the house, broke the window. Yes. Then they went to the bathroom. I don't know. If you come here, perhaps, uh, what did they take? They didn't take anything. The problem is the closed door. There are bloodstains. There was a closed door. Which door is closed? Uh, the door of one of the flatmates who isn't here, and we don't know where she is. And there are bloodstains outside the door of this flatmate who's not there. The bloodstains are in the bathroom. Oh, in the bathroom. And this door is closed. And this girl, do you have her mobile number? Her, yes, yes, we tried to call her, but she's not answering. Okay, I'll send a patrol car now, and we'll check the situation out. Raffaele's like, okay. They're like, okay. He's like, okay, again. And then they're like, here we go. No, they're like, uh, goodbye. And then, you know, then they're done. Is that a weird translation? It reads odd to me. <laughs> the language translation is a little weird there. But anyway, right after Raffaele calls the police, two officers who deal with tech crimes show up to the house unrelated to the call. Uh, they had just received two cell phones, one of which belonged to roommate Filomena Romanelli, or Roman Romanelli. There we go. Uh, Filomena also came home at this point. Neighbor had heard the phones ringing in their garden when Amanda called Meredith earlier. Uh, Filomena arrived at the house and explained that she loaned Meredith her SIM card for her Italian phone so she could make calls. Filomena now checks her room, sees that nothing is missing despite the break-in. By now, a crowd of confused people is gathered inside the house. Filomena's friend, who had arrived with her and her boyfriend, now they kick down Meredith's door. Filomena screams as she enters, a foot, a foot. Another person shouts, blood, my God. And then the police order everyone to get out of the house. All right, the police now enter Meredith's room and find her dead, surrounded by what would later be called a lake of blood. Meredith Duvet was draped over her half-naked body. Right, she's uh, um, you know, her top has been removed. She had been stabbed. Holy shit, forty-seven times. What the fuck? Forty-seven times. That's some serious rage. There was a slash uh, to the throat that severed a major artery, but she didn't die from blood loss, according to some later coroner reports. She was choked uh, or smothered or strangled. Her ability to take in air was cut off by someone's hands. It gets presented in a variety of different fashions in different articles. Uh, this important information gets presented, yeah, uh, in a variety of sources. Uh, stabbed, it seems, with two different knives, perhaps never totally confirmed. Uh, given the differences uh, noted in the size of the knife wounds, it was likely that more than one knife was used. Also had maybe, this goes back and forth later on from various sources, multiple bruises in her vaginal and sphincter area denoting sexual violence had occurred. Later experts will not be able to agree on this. Uh, yeah, so you'll see why I say maybe as we go forward. The investigation full of a stupid amount of maybes. A doctor's testimony suggests that the wounds indicated that in addition to Kircher being choked, her mouth and nose were additionally covered up 
And multiple individuals likely committed the attack on Kircher due to her lack of defensive wounds. But this will also be disputed. It was speculated by the prosecution that one person held her down, pinned her arms while someone else or more than one other person stabbed her, smothered her, etc. Uh, however it occurred, Meredith definitely died at some point on the night of the, uh, of the first. We know that for sure. And then using a lot of conjecture, investigators will come to believe that multiple people killed her in a group sexual act gone wrong. Also, despite valuable items like her laptop not being stolen, making the burglary seem staged, cash was stolen, which does possibly indicate a form of burglary. Uh, Meredith's purse would be found to be missing at least 250 euros. Finally, her room is covered in blood and there are bloody fingerprints on the wall that do not belong to Amanda or Raffaele, by the way. Uh, Raffaele initially explained to the police that Amanda had returned to the house after she spent the night with him. Uh, She went to the bathroom, saw it smeared with so much blood, it looked as though a butcher had attempted washing up and then given up the task, which is weird for him to say that there was so much blood when it was just a few drops, is what she said. Uh, Amanda initially told investigators she did think this was all very strange because her roommates usually kept the bathroom so clean. She thought it was either period blood or an accidental cut. Uh, Interestingly, Raffaele will say that he called the police before the first two officers arrived with the phone. The police will say he definitely called after. Uh, Meredith's parents at home in England uh, at this time, they're watching the news and they see a story uh, on November 2nd about a British girl who had been murdered on the news. How tragic. Meredith's father, John Kircher, attempts to call her 15 to 20 times, receives no answer, knows that only 700 British students are in the Erasmus program, which she was in, fears that Meredith is the girl who was killed. He calls the Mirror, where he worked as a freelance journalist to see what they knew. And that same night, John learns that his daughter Meredith is indeed dead. Just fucking horrific. Okay. So then the, uh, the day after uh, Meredith's dead body is discovered, uh, November 3rd, 2007, Amanda Knox and Raffaele go shopping at a clothing store in town. And this will not look good, and the Italian and British tabloids will have a fucking field day with this. According to store, store owner Carlo Scato di Rinaldi, they purchased underwear, kissed, and hugged. And Raffaele told Amanda, we can have wild sex tonight. That's what he said that Raffaele said. Quote, we can have wild sex tonight. CCT, uh, CCTV captured this interaction, kind of. Uh, video, but not sound. After Rinaldi saw Amanda's face in the news, he told a friend of the police force what he heard and saw. The police obtained the CCTV footage, uh, gave it to uh, Perugia's prosecutor, Giuliano uh, Mignini. We're going to get to know this guy pretty well. Uh, within a few more days, the footage was released to media outlets around the world. Because of this, Amanda instantly becomes guilty in the court of public opinion. Amanda explained in the 2013 ABC interview she gave many years later that she had to go to the store because she needed underwear and was waiting for some understanding of what was going to happen and whether or not I would even have access to my own things. I needed a pair of underwear and I went to that store. I took one off the shelf near the cash register. I bought it and Raffaele kissed me. Now, I don't know what the store owner thinks he heard or did not hear, but we in no way said he or I that we were off to go have hot sex. So why would the store owner lie? Eh, Maybe he didn't. Maybe Amanda's lying. Or maybe that shop owner was pressured to lie by some tabloid reporter. I do think many sensationalist tabloid reporters are morally bankrupt fucking dirtbags who will pressure people to tell them what they want to hear or just make up what someone supposedly said. And I think that because court case after court case after court case has proven that various tabloids, especially British tabloids, who sure seem to be the most aggressive and did cover this case extensively from the beginning, have lost many libel cases for their uh, defamatory actions over and over again. Uh, the CCTV footage of this is really damning if you believe the shop owner. In the footage, Amanda and Raffaele don't seem upset. They're laughing, smiling, and kissing. And they're doing this a day after Meredith is found dead, right? Bad look. Uh, you never know with 100% certainty how you will react to something you've never previously experienced, but I would think that if my roommate was brutally murdered in my apartment, I might not be out in public laughing and kissing it up and uh, you know getting my fuck on if that was happening. I might be too shaken up about the murder that occurred a few feet from where I sleep. Might be grieving the loss of my roommate. Might be a little worried that I could be next since no killer has been caught. Or not worried if I am the killer. However, if she had to buy some new clothes because her house is a sealed off crime scene, why not go with Raffaele to buy that, you know, those clothes? They've only been together a week. You would need a new pair of underwear, right? They're both very young. It's hot and heavy. They're both, uh, they both just experienced tragedy. But also, neither one of them were really close friends of Meredith's. Raffaele barely knew her, and while Amanda hung out with her, she'd only lived with her for less than six weeks. Uh, For the record, I do think it's fucking weird 
that she doesn't seem, you know, busted up, but also her not heavily constantly grieving the loss of someone she doesn't have a super close relationship with. You know, I guess that that is not uncommon and people process things differently. And she could have been crying five minutes before that footage. And again, five minutes afterwards. We don't know. Uh, Raffaele could have been doing his best just to cheer her up, you know, trying to look at this from various angles. Later the same day, Amanda was brought back to the house to inspect the knife drawer to see if anything was missing. Uh, she doesn't notice anything and does begin to cry hysterically and covers her ears with her hands. On November 4th, 2007, prosecutor uh, Mignini uh, orders Amanda and Raffaele's cell phones to be secretly wiretaped. Uh, their conversations and interviews were descri- uh, transcribed for the police. According to, again, Vanity Fair, the police could not believe that she seemed more focused on spending time with her boyfriend than being uh, devastated by her roommate's murder. Uh, for the record, I don't care much for Vanity Fair. I think, they are ins- I think they're insanely biased in a lot of their stories and have recently become not much more than a tabloid themselves. But I do think their older articles, like 10 years back and more, long before the last two election cycles, uh, show a lot less bias than they do now and that they have done some great investigative journalism in, in the past in certain cases. Hopefully this is one of those cases. Since their investigation provides details uh, about certain moments in this timeline that are not found to the same depth in other sources. Anyway, Amanda and Raffaele uh, now go to the police station for an interview. At the police station, uh, when she does end up being told she'll be questioned, Amanda allegedly becomes agitated. Raffaele tries to make her feel better by teaching her curse words in Italian, and they laugh together, which does nothing to win them favor with the police. Amanda speaks on the phone with her friends later and says, if they ask me to stay on over Christmas, I'm going to ask someone for help. I can't stay at their beck and call forever. Uh, some acquaintances who talked to Amanda after the murder were shocked by her behavior. Uh, Giacomo Salenzi, a romantic interest in some sources, he's listed that way, of Meredith's, uh, said Amanda was as cool as anything and completely emotionless. Uh, Amanda could tell that the police were suspicious of her. And, for, right, and that whole like, romantic interest shows that she wasn't some like virginal chase person. This, this guy who lives nearby, right down below, you know, they're, they're hooking up, whatever. Uh, Amanda could tell that the police were suspicious of her. She told one of her friends they treat me like a criminal. One of Meredith's friends told the police that when she said she hoped Meredith didn't suffer, Amanda responded, how could she not? She got her fucking throat slit. Amanda explained that reaction in, a, in that same 2013 ABC interview saying, I was angry, was pacing, thinking about what Meredith was, must have went through. I had already been through hours of questioning and her friends came much later and they were much more vulnerable. And in that moment, I wasn't sensitive enough to their feelings. But what I was hearing was that somebody did something horrible to my friend and I could not conceive how it could be anything but how horrible it was. And that's what my exclamation was, exclamation was all about. I think everyone's reaction to something horrible is different. I went through multiple emotions in the reaction to what I found out and I discovered about what happened to Meredith. Part of it was shock and disbelief. Part of it was sadness. Part of it was anger. Part of it was this stubborn drive to do what I thought an adult would do, which was help. Uh, Prosecutors soon learned that Amanda and Meredith allegedly didn't get along. Uh, I think this got way overblown in the media, but one of their supposed disagreements was over Amanda uh, keeping condoms in a vibrator. In their shared bathroom, right? And this points to her again being scandalous in the Italian authorities' eyes. How dare she practice safe sex and have a vibrator for harmless self-pleasure? What's happening, Lucifina? I'm scared. Amanda later told ABC, this is one of the more strange things that happened was that no one ever confronted me. No one about the things that I kept in the bathroom or what, like what friends I had. Uh, That was never discussed while we were living together. The one time that she ever confronted me about something was she was very embarrassed and nice about it. And I was very embarrassed and like awkwardly laughing about it afterwards. And that was when like discussing that after you flush the toilet, you have to use the brush, (laughs) which is not something that I was used to. And that was fairly early on. And that was not something that happened afterwards. And it was fine. We didn't have an estrangement and we didn't argue about anything. That's very funny to me. They're just like, you know, they've lived together a few days. I was like, hey, yeah, you gotta, you gotta use the brush. Can't, uh, can't leave the little poopy residue on the bottom of the bowl. Uh, backing up now to the days after Meredith's murder, Prosecutor uh, Mignini continued listening to Amanda's private conversations. He heard Amanda tell her uh, friend Robin Butterworth that she saw Meredith's body by the closet with the cover or a sheet over her. According to Butterworth, it seemed like Amanda was proud that she was the first to find Meredith. And if true, you know, maybe a little weird. Uh, Mignini didn't uh, know how Amanda could have seen Meredith's body, though, if the bedroom door was closed and locked. Mignini took this information to a panel of judges. At this time, he uh, still didn't know how many people were involved, who was involved, or if Meredith was raped or not. All they knew was that Amanda Knox was their main suspect. The judges wrote about her, 
Amanda never showed any visible grief for the tragic loss of her friend, but rather indulged in ostentatious displays of affection with Raffaele, even going as far as the paradoxical purchase of an item of intimate apparel, apparently for use in having, quote, wild sex. Amanda is a restless person who does not disdain multiple frequentations. Uh, what? Does not disdain multiple frequentations. Is that their way of saying that she slept around? Like, what the fuck does that mean? And yes, she bought underwear because she wasn't allowed to go to her room and get her other underwear. And uh, all of this is circumstantial. Uh, and, and I feel like now is a good time to share my opinion of prosecutor uh, Giuliano Magnini. Not a big fan of this guy. Uh, I consider him to be an extremely sexist douchebag, super arrogant, pompous, sh- frankly, shitty investigator. After watching a few hours of documentaries where he is heavily interviewed, I came to find his face extremely punchable. He makes a number of comments about how important his Catholic faith is to him, which is fine, but then also insinuates on multiple occasions that Amanda is an immoral slut based clearly, based clearly excuse me, on his spiritual beliefs. Right? Not fine when those beliefs bleed over into a criminal investigation. Uh, he also talks at one point about how much he loves Sherlock Holmes as a detective. Why? Because he's a great detective who finds important clues in seemingly insignificant details. And that's scary. Right? Just just work with the fucking facts that are given you. Don't, don't try to read into shit. And he's saying this as though Sherlock Holmes was a real person and not a fictional fucking character made up by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And then in his own example of doing some shit that should only appear in fiction, he states that when a woman kills another woman, she tends to cover up the body, like how Meredith's body was found covered up with a blanket. And then he adds, quote, a man would never think to do that. What the fuck is he talking about? We have covered numerous male killers who have covered up the bodies of their victims. The grim sleeper, Lonnie Franklin, quickly comes to mind for one, right? He specifically used a blanket to cover up uh, at least one of his murder victims. Uh, Giuliano says uh, more dumb shit later that I don't want to reveal now because it speaks to details we haven't covered yet. Uh, Before moving forward uh, to make sure I don't forget, he does do this thing that I fucking hate and I just think makes him such a shitty investigator, right? He, uh, He often speaks in terms of absolute certainty regarding things that you can't be absolutely certain of. Uh, Like he'll say stuff like men always do this. Women never do that. When this is found at a crime scene, it always indicates this. It never indicates that. Right? Easy know-it-all. You're not that fucking smart. Life is usually gray, not black and white. And in the end, his investigation, he will, will run lead on this investigation, will be called out by the Italian Supreme Court for being heavily flawed. Stunning flaws is the quote they used. Stunning flaws in the investigation. Okay, returning now to the timeline. Uh, November 5th, 2007, three days after Meredith's body is found, Raffaele Celesito called in for questioning again. A man does not, but comes with him and waits in the hallway. Uh, the police question Raffaele about uh, what happened on the night on November 1st. And according to him, uh, they tell him, uh, according to him later, they told him that Amanda was a liar and, quote, a stupid slut, a cow. They didn't care about him. They wanted him to tell the truth, they kept saying, about her involvement. And Meredith's murder, right? They were gunning for her. Meanwhile, while at the police station, according to the police, Amanda was literally doing cartwheels and yoga stretches. Amanda later told ABC she was not doing cartwheels. She was reacting in an upset manner. If she was doing cartwheels, I wouldn't be surprised, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, you know, she likes to sing to herself, uh, does fucking weird moves and things. Uh, by a lot of accounts and by my own observation of her in various interviews, yes, she's a weirdo. And she seemed, again, a lot weirder like many of us when she was younger. I think about the other account of her suddenly loudly singing in a bar out of nowhere, right? Her eccentric theatrical personality did not endear her to the Italian public, to investigators, you know, journalists. And I do feel bad for her in this sense as a fellow weirdo. weirdo. I often apparently do not notice when I'm singing in public. Uh, not loudly, but sometimes, you know, I just get lost in a little daydream. Sometimes my mouth moves along to what I'm saying in my daydream. Sometimes I'm humming or singing little songs, little made up ditties and don't totally realize it right away. Lindsay's pointed this out to me. And I feel like if I was being observed as a suspect, I would almost certainly do shit that if recorded would not endear me to a jury, the public, investigators, etc. After hours of being interrogated again, Raffaele changes his uh, an important part of his original statement. He had previously told the police police that he was home the entire night with Amanda. Now, Raffaele claims that on the night of November 1st, the night Meredith was murdered, he was working on his computer at home and smoking weed and said that at 8 p.m. Amanda left him for five hours to go to Patrick uh, Lumumba's bar, which no one will attest to. 
He said that his original statement that Amanda was with him the whole night was a sack of bullshit and that Amanda pressured him to lie. Then a few days later, he'll change his statement again. His third version of events will be that he can't remember much about the night of November 1st. He was too high on weed. Couldn't say for sure if Amanda was with him the whole time or if she might have left his house at some point. Why did he change his story? Well, in a memoir, Raphael uh, will publish in 2012. He will allege that the police, during his second interrogation, stripped him naked, threatened him, and slapped him around. They beat him, scared him, pressured him into telling them what they wanted him to say. They made him think he would spend the rest of his life in prison if he did not tell them what they wanted to hear about the investigation. After his interrogation, the police now approach Amanda and tell her what uh, Raffaele had said. They ask for her phone. She gives it to them. They see a text from her boss, Patrick, as well as her response. When literally translated to English, Amanda said, uh, we will see each other later. Have a good night. Amanda, not fluent in Italian at this point. Not at all. Uh, She claimed she tried to write, see you later, have a good night. Big difference between we will see each other later and see you later. Also, I'm guessing as someone very fluent in Italian, you know, it's real easy to switch that stuff up. You know, when you learn another language in a formal academic setting, you learn the proper way to speak, which is not often the way people actually speak. And this text will now, you know, haunt her. Amanda told them that she was just responding to his text, asking her not to come to work. You know, and that, yeah, I'll see you later. Like when I do come to work, the police told her that she made an appointment with him. And then, you know, she just didn't remember it. And she's, uh, they said, clearly your mind is fucked and you are going to be either on our side or you're going to be on the murderer's side. And what side are you on? And then Amanda uh, says that she responded, I don't know what the fuck is going on. And apparently the police, when they heard the word fuck come from her, she says this in English, they become angry. And one officer said, fuck, I understand. Fuck, fuck you. Amanda cried during questioning, and then an officer allegedly slapped her on the head, said, remember, supposedly she got slapped numerous times, kept bopping her in the back of the head, remember, remember, yelling at her. Uh, Mignini, the prosecutor, he will later say that he felt Amanda had problems with authority and that she was an anarchist. (laughs) That's his word. She was a fucking anarchist who hated authority. Nothing she has done before this that is public knowledge, and nothing she has done since points to her being an anarchist. Seems pretty quiet and reserved. Uh, November 6, 2007, after being interrogated again, this time all night long, Amanda, who is not offered legal counsel, counsel, neither was Raffaele, signs a confession, admitting to being in another room while her boss, Patrick Lumamba, uh, oh my God, Lumamba, murders Meredith Kircher. Amanda is then arrested and held in prison. Lumamba also is arrested. He'll be held for a couple weeks. Not only was Amanda questioned without an attorney present, right? She's never even offered an interpreter. And again, she's not fluent in Italian. She came to Italy to become fluent. But that's still a ways off. Over the course of this investigation, she will give conflicting statements about what she was doing that night. Amanda will later claim that the police coerced her into accusing others and changing her statement around through fear, intimidation, and actual physical abuse. Uh, she said she was scared and confused. Amanda said that uh, that night she had various memories of the street in front of Raffaele's apartment, the front door of her house being opened, Patrick Lumamba in his brown leather jacket, and Meredith screaming. And she ended up thinking that maybe these memories uh, were memories of Meredith's murder. That's what she tells the police at this time. The following is a translation of Amanda's confession made at 1.45 a.m. November 6, 2007. Amanda did have an interpreter for the confession, but after hours and hours of being interrogated with that one. So she says, in order to complete what has been retailed before means, before by means of precedent declarations made at this office, what the fuck, I wish to clarify that I know and see other people who have also come to my house sometimes and who have also met Meredith and of whom I will provide the relevant mobile numbers. <laughs> so she's saying this stuff and somebody who's not really good at English is writing this down. I feel like they could have hired a better translator. That doesn't sound like something that anyone would say. Did you ever introduce anyone to Meredith? Yes. Allow me to clarify. I know and see other people. Other people have come to my house. Also, sometimes other people have also met Meredith. For whom I will provide relevant mobile numbers. Uh, one of these relevant people is Patrick, uh, described in this, again, in this translation. I don't think she was saying this shit. They describe him as a first, as a colored citizen who is about 175 centimeters tall with braids, owner of pub La Chic, uh, located in Via Alessi. And I know that he lives in the area near the roundabout of Porta Pese. Then a telephone number. A uh, pub where I work twice a week on Mondays and on Thursdays from uh, 2200 until about two, right? So from 10 to two in the morning. And that, this feels coerced to me. 
Last Thursday is November, day on which I usually work. While I was in the apartment of my boyfriend, Raffaele, at about 2030, I received a message from Patrick on my mobile, telling me that evening the pub would remain closed because there were no people. Therefore, I didn't have to go to work. I replied to the message saying that we would meet immediately. <laughs> Which isn't either translation that doesn't say that. Therefore, I went out telling my boyfriend that I had to go to work. Okay. I wish to state first that in the afternoon I had smoked a joint with Raffaele. Therefore, I felt confused because I do not usually make use of narcotics nor harder drugs. Ha! <laughs> She's talking about what? It's weed. What the fuck are these idiots talking about? She, uh, I met Patrick soon after the basketball court of Piazza Gramana and we went home. I do not remember if Meredith was already there or if she came later. I find it difficult to remember those moments, but Patrick had sex with Meredith with whom he was infatuated, but I do not remember well if Meredith had been threatened before. I vaguely remember that he killed her. (laughs) Fuck, what? Yeah, yeah, yes, Patrick had sex with Meredith. He once clarified that on his mobile number. That I remember. He was infatuated with her. He might have killed her. Not sure. I can't always remember all details of life when under influence of harder drug like marijuana narcotic. Uh, So the office acknowledges it says that the statement stops here and Knox Amanda is put at the disposal of the preceding judicial authority. And then Amanda makes another confession. 5.45 a.m. now. Clearly sleep deprived. Has been continually pressured by interrogators to provide more details. Still no lawyer. She says, I wish to relate spontaneously what happened because these events have deeply bothered me. And I'm really afraid of Patrick, the African boy. (laughs) What the fuck? Who owns the pub called La Cheek. Located in Via Alessi, where I work periodically. Is, is he a, quote, colored citizen or an African boy? Which racist term did these cops seem to have put in her mouth through the translator? This is absurd. Uh, the translator continues, uh, I met him in the evening of November 1, 2007, after sending him a reply message saying, I will see you. We met soon after about 2100 at the basketball court of Piazza Gramana. Went to my apartment in Via della Pagola. Number seven, I do not clearly remember if Meredith was already at home or if she came later. What I can say is that Patrick and Meredith went into Meredith's room while I think I stayed in the kitchen. Okay. Cannot remember how long they stayed together in the room, but I can only say that at a certain point, I heard Meredith screaming. And as I was scared, I plugged up my ears. Okay. Then do not remember anything. I am very confused. I do not remember if Meredith was screaming. And I heard some thuds too because I was upset, but I imagined what could have happened. She must have really smoked some crazy, strong, harder drug narcotic marijuana to have reacted so unusually. She says, then I, I have met Patrick this morning in front of the university, U- Universita uh, per Stranieri, something like that. And he was asked and he asked and he's asked me some questions to be more accurate. He wanted to know what the policeman had asked me. I think he has also asked me if I wanted to see some journalists, maybe in order to know if I knew anything about Meredith's death. I'm not sure if Raffaele was there as well that night. But I clearly remember that I woke up at my boyfriend's home in his bed and then I came back home in the morning when I found the door of the apartment open. When I woke up in the morning on November 2nd, I was in bed with my boyfriend. And then they write, it is acknowledged that Knox repeatedly brings her hands on her head and shakes it. Read confirmed and underside at the time and in the place mentioned above. I don't know if Amanda is guilty or not 100%, but uh, what the fuck is this shit? I've watched her in a lot of interviews from around the time of the murder to recently. I've watched uh, televised courtroom appearances where she speaks. This does not sound like her. <laughs> it sounds first off like a terrible translation, but also like the shit an exhausted and scared person would say if they were being pressured by people speaking in a language they only kind of understand and these people poorly translate it and coerce a person into signing this fucking document. Amanda now makes a written statement to the prosecutor that, uh, the same day that contradicts all of this while she is not being supposedly hit and yelled at. Now she writes, all this is very strange, I know, but really what has happened is just as confusing to me as it is to everyone else. I have been told there is hard evidence saying that I was at the place of the murder of my friend when it happened. This, I want to confirm, is something that to me, if asked a few days ago, would be impossible. I know that Raffaele has placed evidence against me, saying I left him during the night of Meredith's murder, but let me tell you this. In my mind, there are things I remember and things that are confused. My account of the story goes as follows. Despite the evidence stacked against me, Thursday, November 1st, I saw Meredith the last time in my house when she left around three or four in the afternoon. Raffaele was with me at the time. We, Raffaele and I, stayed at my house for a little while longer. Around five in the evening, we left to watch the movie Amelie at his house. After the movie, I received a message from Patrick, for whom I work at the Pub Le Chic, 
He told me the message that it wasn't necessary for me to come into work for the evening because there was no one at my work. I also remember now sending the message, uh, si vendiamo, buena serata, back to him. And this, to me, doesn't mean I would meet with him immediately, especially since I said, uh, buona serata. I just like, fucking see you later. What happened next, uh, I know, doesn't match up with what Raffaele is saying, but this is what I remember. I told Raffaele that I didn't have to work, that I could remain at home for the evening. After that, I believe we relaxed in his room together. Perhaps I checked my email. Perhaps I read or studied, or perhaps I made love to Raffaele. In fact, I think I did make love with him. However, I admit that this period of time is rather strange because I'm not quite sure. I smoked marijuana with him and I might have even fallen asleep. These things I'm not sure about. And I know they are important both to the case and to help myself. But in reality, I don't think I did much. One thing I do remember is that I took a shower with Raffaele and this may explain how we passed the time. In truth, I don't remember exactly what day this was, but I do remember we showered, cleaned ourselves for a long time. He took care to clean my ears and dry and brush my hair. In regards to things I know for sure happened the night that Meredith was murdered was that Raffaele and I ate fairly late. I thought around 11 in the evening, although I can't be sure because I didn't look at the clock. After dinner, I noticed a little blood on Raffaele's hand, but I was under the impression that it was blood from the fish. After we ate, Raffaele washed the dishes, but the pipes uh, under his sink broke and water flooded the floor. But because he didn't have a mop, I said we could clean it up tomorrow because we, Meredith, Laura, Filomena, and I have a mop at home. I remembered it was quite late because we were both very tired though I can't say the time. Next thing I remember was waking up the morning of Friday, November 2nd, around 10 a.m. I took a plastic bag to bring back dirty clothes to go back to my house. It was then I arrived home alone and I found the door to my house wide open and all this began. In regards to this confession, in quotes, that I made last night, I want to make clear that I'm very doubtful of the veracity of my statements because they were made under the pressure of stress, shock, and extreme exhaustion. Not only was I told I would be arrested and put in jail for 30 years, I was also hit in the head when I didn't remember a fact, quote, correctly. I understand that the police are under a lot of stress, so I understand the treatment I received. That last sentence, that last sentence is a bit telling to me, I think. I understand that the police are under a lot of stress, so I understand the treatment I received. To me here, she's saying, I need to make it clear that these motherfuckers were abusing me, but also need to pretend that that's okay to do so that these corrupt fucks don't do something worse to me. And then she continues and things get really weird here. Either uh, she is someone who is really hiding some, something or she is just fucked up mentally from being interrogated, scared, and genuinely confused. Because now she continues to point the blame at someone who for sure had nothing to do with the murder as, you know, you'll find out. Well, I, mean, I think I, I've already said that, you know, has an alibi. Uh, also a chance she was scared, knew the police wanted her uh, boss to take the fall and knowingly threw him under the bus. So now she says, However, it was under this pressure and after many hours of confusion that my mind came up with these answers. In my mind, I saw Patrick in flashes of blurred images. I saw him near the basketball court. I saw him at my front door. I saw myself cowering in the kitchen with my hands over my ears because in my head, or in my head, I could hear Meredith screaming. But I've said this many times so as to make myself clear. These things seem unreal to me like a dream. And I'm convinced that they, un- and I'm conv- convinced that they are unsure sorry just weird phrasing if they are real things that happened or just dreams as my mind made to try to answer the questions in my head and the questions i'm being asked but the truth is i'm unsure about the truth and here's why one the police have told me that they have hard evidence that proves i was in in my house at the time of meredith's murder i don't know what this proof is but if it's true then it means i'm very confused and my dreams must be true two my boyfriend has claimed that i have said things that i know were not true i know i told him i didn't have to work that night I remember that moment very clearly. I also never asked him to lie for me. That is absolutely a lie. What I don't understand is why Raffaele, who has always been so caring and gentle with me, would lie about this. What does he have to hide? I don't think he killed Meredith, but I do think he is scared, like me. He walked into a situation that he's never been in, and perhaps he's trying to find a way out by disassociating himself with me. Honestly, I understand because this is a very scary situation. And I'd like to add that in the Netflix doc about Man in 2016, They showed footage of Amanda talking to her mom about all this. And her mom tells her that maybe Raffaele said, you know, things about her that weren't true because like her, he was being pressured and beaten and harassed by investigators, which he will say later, as I said earlier. Uh, I also know she says that the police didn't believe things of me that I know I can explain, such as one. I know the police are confused as to why it took me so long to call someone after I found the door to my house open and blood in the bathroom. The truth is, I wasn't sure what to think, but I definitely didn't think the worst that someone was murdered. I thought a lot of things, mainly that perhaps someone got hurt and left quickly to take care of it. I also thought that maybe one of my roommates was having menstrual problems and hadn't cleaned up. Perhaps I was in shock, but at the time, I didn't know what to think, and that's the truth. That is why I talked to Raffaele about it in the morning, because I was worried and wanted advice. 
Two, I also know that the fact that I can't fully recall the events that I claim took place at Raffaele's home during the time that Meredith was murdered is incriminating. And I stand by my statements that I made last night about events that could have taken place in my home with Patrick. But I want to make it very clear that these events seem more unreal to me than what I said before, that I stayed at Raffaele's house. Three, I'm very confused at this time. My head is full of contrasting ideas, and I know it can be frustrating to work with for this reason. But I also want to tell the truth as best I can. Everything I have said in regards to my involvement in Meredith's death, though contrasting, is the best truth I've been able to think. Think of it this way. What am I supposed to think has happened when I think is really true about myself and what I have done is told to me to be a lie? At first, I was scared, offended, and confused. But as time, shock, and panic came on, I began to try and think of other explanations. And it is because I have to think in this way that I feel it contrasts with myself. There is one thing that I think in myself is true, but there is also another possibility that could be true. And I can't can't honestly think for sure what is what. I'm trying. I really am because I'm scared. I know I didn't kill Meredith. That's all I know for sure. In these flashbacks that I'm having, I see Patrick as the murderer, but the way the truth feels in my mind, there's no way for me to have known because I don't remember for sure if I was at my house that night. The questions that need answering, at least for how I think, is one, why did Raffaele lie? Uh, did Raffaele lie? Why did I think of Patrick? Uh, three, is the evidence proving my presence at the time and place of the crime reliable? If so, what does that say about my memory? Is it reliable? Four, is there any other evidence condemning Patrick or any other person? Five, who is the real murderer? This is particularly important because I don't feel I can be used as condemning testimony in this instance. I have a clear mind that I've had before, but I'm still missing parts, which I know is bad for me. But this is the truth, and this is what I'm thinking at this time. Please don't yell at me because it only makes me more confused, which doesn't help anyone. I understand how serious the situation is, and as such, I want to give you this information as soon and as clearly as possible. If there are still parts that don't make sense, please ask me. I'm doing my best, just like you are. Please believe me at least in that, although I can understand if you don't. All I know is that I didn't kill Meredith, and so I have nothing but lies to be afraid of. Okay, I know that was a lot, but very important details to convey, I think. Uh, Also, uh, I I corrected them in my notes for narrative purposes, but there was a shitload of spelling errors in that statement. The type of spelling errors made repeatedly that to me aren't made by someone of Amanda's education level when she wrote this. Uh, Was she a just a really shitty speller? Sure. Of course, that's possible. Uh, Or did she make those mistakes because she was exhausted and confused and scared? Right. She'd been up all night. If we believe her abused by guards for hours, you know, yelling at her, smacking her in the head. Was she just not in her right mind by the time she wrote that? And when she made those statements. During her time in prison, Amanda will begin to keep a diary, parts of which will be leaked to the press. Uh, It's not as long as what I just read. Let's look further into her mental state and her thoughts about all this when she's still freaked out, but not being harshly interrogated and sleep deprived. And one entry, all of these are undated. She says, it's me, Luigi. Bum, 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 Spaghetti bolognese. Eh, mi piero is muy gordo. Como sta Lamborghini? Donatella Versace. Giorgio Romare. Donde sta la biblioteca? It's Michael Corleone. Masterclass. Nailed it again. In English, that was, hey, it's me, Amanda Knox. I'm a victim of a great injustice. I love the library. It's where I get to write my diary. I'm innocent. Okay. I know, I know some of what I said might have sounded like it was in Spanish and not Italian. Listen, they're very similar. We master linguists know that they uh, are both romance languages, but to a language novice, like maybe yourself, it can come across as confusing. Uh, This is what Amanda really wrote. She wrote, "Uh, I'm writing this because I want to remember. I want to remember because this is an experience that uh, not many people will ever have. I'm not saying I'm glad everything that has happened has happened. If it were up to me, my friend would have never been killed and we would all still be living together in our home. We were really very good together. What I really want to do is talk to my mom. She arrived last night, but hasn't been able to talk to me. She's most certainly freaking out. But after I'm interrogated, either today or tomorrow, I'll be able to talk to her. And hopefully soon afterward, I will be able to go free. I also want to remember how I remembered everything that happened that night. I was in my cell thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking, hoping I would remember, hoping that I had done the right thing, worried that maybe the police are right. Maybe I had seen Meredith's death and maybe I really was confused and couldn't remember something so tragic. In my cell, I was waiting for an answer to come to my head when a sister arrived at my door. She told me to be patient because God knows everything and would help me remember the answer. I nodded along, and after a while, the sister left, wishing me good luck. Perhaps a minute later, I sat down again to write and try to remember, and then it hit me. Everything came back to me like a flood, one detail after another, until the moment my head hit the pillow and I was asleep. Meredith was murdered. 
I cried. I was so happy. I wrote everything I could remember and an explanation for my previously illegible uh, comments. And this is what happened since I've been here. You know what's interesting? I'm affectionately curious about how Raffaele is. Are they treating him well? He must be really scared. I also want to know why he lied about me. Is he still lying? What will happen to me if he keeps it up? I know I'm not a suspect of the murder because Meredith was raped and then killed, but the police want to think that I'm involved. Most likely they will yell at me again and tell me I'm a liar and trying to protect someone. But now I at least know it's not true. I remember what I did that night and there's no way they can prove that I was there. And especially that I was in Meredith's room because it is impossible. They lied to me when they told me they knew I was at home because that is impossible. I wasn't at home and therefore they can't prove it. I'm upset they lied to me about that. They really think I'm involved and it's sad because it means they still have no idea what happened. They really don't know who killed my friend. They know nothing if they want to lean on me and my testimony because I know nothing. It's so sad. And then one more entry. I cannot stop thinking about that big turd I saw on the toilet right before my world was turned upside down. Whose was it? I have to think whoever laid down that brown sword is the real killer. Who? Who baptized that family-sized baby Ruth? Who dropped that rotten, thrice-baked potato into our ceramic crock pot? Who drowned that manly brown python in our lady toot pond? Something about the whole case against me stinks. And if I could only get my hands on that filth pickle, I know the truth of who dropped it would set me free. Okay, maybe I wrote that. Maybe Amanda wrote, in bed I've been thinking about what I'm doing. (laughs) Sorry, it's so stupid. This is really what she wrote. In bed I've been thinking about what I'm going to do when I'm finally out of here. I've been thinking about my friends at home, wondering what I'm going to say to them about this experience because I know I'm not walking out of the same uh, same person. How can I grow from this? I don't think I'm ever wandering around alone after dark because of this. I also hope that I'm not scared to be alone. I don't want to be traumatized because of this. I want to live happily like I was, if understandably a little more cautious. I guess I've grown up a bit and I'm not even sure what this means. Maybe now I know the world can be really dangerous and even more than that, life in the world can be confusing sometimes without sense. Amen, sister. The world can be so confusing without sense. Makes me think about all the cults we've covered. Makes me think about a lot of the laws in this country and others, about all the strange religious interpretation that goes on every day. So much of this world makes such little sense. And that is pretty fucking scary. Uh, Amanda wrote all that while she was, you know, held in prison just outside of Perugia. And uh, she is far from the first person to complain about police brutality in Italy. Do a web search for police brutality and a lot of shit comes up. Seems to be a real problem. Uh, It wasn't until 2017 that a law in Italy was finally passed after years of international pressure to make prisoner torture, such as uh, Amanda claimed happened to her, illegal. Isn't that fucking crazy? Right? The term, here's what what it said about this law. The term torture under the law passed after all this means any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purposes as obtaining from him or a third person information or confession punishing him for an act he or a third person has committed or is suspected of having committed or intimidating or coercing him or a third person or for any reason based on discrimination of any kind when such pain or suffering is inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent or acquiescence of a public official or other person acting in an official capacity. Right, Those motherfuckers could legally smack Amanda around, scream at her, deprive her of sleep, etc. It's wild. And why are anti-torture laws like that passed? Well, they are not only passed to protect people from being abused, they're also passed because numerous credible studies have shown over and over again that aggressive interrogation techniques routinely lead to false confessions. Noted neuroscientist Shane O'Mara, professor of experimental brain research at Trinity College in Dublin, wrote in a 2009 paper that torture subjects will simply lie to make their torment end. He wrote that stress caused by torture is likely to impair regions of the brain associated with memory, making it likely that subjects will lie or parrot information picked up from their captors. In other words, interrogators can plant false memories into their stress targets. To a prisoner being tortured, the logic is simple. Talking makes the torment end. And the cost-benefit analysis of saying something, anything, is easy to work out. Right? Studies have shown it is super fucking easy to extract a false confession. Uh, Multiple studies have shown that simply accusing someone of a crime and claiming that evidence of their wrongdoing exists, exactly like what happens, you know, here with Amanda Knox, is enough to get innocent people to think they have done something they definitely didn't do. A 1996 study asked participants to type words into a keyboard. I love this, actually. Right? They're they're asked to type words into a keyboard. Uh, But they're told if they hit the alt key, 
it's going to crash. The program's going to crash. After a minute, the computer then crashes of its own accord. But participants are told they must have been responsible. When pressed, a significant number of people end up confessing to this imaginary crime. And an even greater number do so when an accomplice claims that they had seen them do it. Overall, 69% of 75 subjects who experimenters were monitoring, uh, people who for sure never fucking hit that alt key, ended up signing signing a confession saying that they had hit the alt key. And then when told the truth, 28% expressed uh, surprise because they had internalized the lie. They truly became convinced that they had done something they definitely didn't do, right? Unreal. Another study from 2005 backed these findings up by showing the participants in a study accused of cheating on a series of logic problems by giving answers to an accomplice offered a false confession almost half the time when told that their wrongdoing wasn't that bad and the interrogator offered to cut them, quote, a deal. Why did any of this come into play with Amanda Knox? If she's telling the truth, then yeah, fuck yeah, it did. That's very important. Uh, Back to the timeline again now. November 8th, 2007, five days after Meredith's murdered body has been found, Amanda, Amanda finally meets with her lawyers now. Carlo Dalla Vedova and Luciano Girga. They're hired by Amanda's family and will represent her throughout both her trial and appeal. A week later, November 15th, 2007, investigators find traces of Meredith's DNA on the blade of an eight-inch knife, kitchen knife, and Amanda's DNA on the knife handle. This knife was found inside a Raffaele uh, uh, Selecito's home. Uh, this evidence initially seems, you know, very damning especially when combined with additional so-called evidence, right? Amanda's DNA found also mixed with Meredith's blood on the bathroom faucet. Uh, Surveillance video allegedly showed Amanda near the house where, uh, when Meredith was killed. And uh, as we read, Amanda had, you know, also confessed, or as I read, you know, kind of. Uh, The Supreme Court eventually threw out Amanda's statements because she did not have a lawyer present when she gave them. And the video deemed too poor uh, quality to be useful. I found this video or at least a a good still image taken from it on New York Daily News' website. (laughs) And they act like it's some smoking gun. Whoever wrote that article and whoever approved it to be published are soulless scumbags who care more about clicks and integrity. The one in the video is not fucking definitely Amanda by a long shot. The one in the video could be, I don't know, one of any probably 20,000 women in Perugia that night. Roughly the same size as Amanda. And that's about it. It's a fucking joke. It's a grainy image of some random woman who seems to have dark hair. You know, people, uh, you know, seeing what they want to see if they actually believe that that is Amanda. Uh, Defense experts also later found that the picture knife uh, found could not have caused Meredith's fatal wounds. It was actually the wrong size, which I would have come across. I wish I would have come across that fact earlier than I did. Olivia found it and threw it in the first draft of notes. And then my dumb ass got ahead of myself and wasted a good hour trying to figure out how the fuck investigators determined that this knife found in Raffaele's kitchen was for sure one of the knives used to kill Meredith. Well, I couldn't find that information because it doesn't exist. They just fucking guessed, just lied, just made some shit up, right? Seem, seemed like the right size, kind of, based on wounds, you know, found uh, where Amanda had been and they had such a hard on for convicting her. They just, you know, made the glove fit. And the DNA evidence on that knife, well, Carla uh, Vecchiati, an appendant Italian forensic science lab technician slash genetics researcher slash medical doctor, said that that knife was likely contaminated in the lab where it was examined, like very likely. She said in a huge breach of lab protocol, investigators admitted to her it was not examined alone away from other evidence. It was examined right alongside 50 fucking samples of shit that was covered in Meredith's DNA. If just one lab tech touched one of those other 50 samples, then touched the knife, or it just kind of fell from their glove, a little minuscule particle onto the knife, that would explain the tiny trace amount of DNA on the knife. It was a very small amount. If the knife bumped into anything with Meredith's DNA on it in the lab, even slightly, that would explain the trace amount. And of course, Amanda's DNA is on it. It's a knife in the kitchen of her boyfriend's house that she had definitely used to help prepare some meals, you know, that they ate. For fuck's sake. And the, the DNA of hers being mixed up with Meredith in the bathroom. It's like, well, yeah, they used the same sink. It could have been from her saliva. It could have been from her brushing her teeth. Despite all this coming out later, back in mid-November 2007, Italian investigators are theorized that Meredith's murder happened when Meredith declined to participate in some random sexual act with Amanda and Raffaele, perhaps a sex ritual, and they used this discredited information to show that, you know, she was involved somehow, and they pulled the sex stuff just out of thin air, and they, uh, they said Amanda and then Raffaele then staged a burglary to throw off the police, right? This, this, this shit truly just came out of their fucking rigatoni mariana maserati assholes. Uh, they just decided that Amanda was a whore. Meredith was a good girl. And, you know, so Amanda killed her when, uh, I don't know, she wouldn't lick her fucking pussy when, you know, Raffaele was fucking her or something. Just not complete gibberish nonsense backed up by literally no evidence at all. 
Five days later, November 20th, 2007, another character enters this mess, right? Uh, the most important character, Rudy, we've met before. Rudy Gaudet, arrested in Germany now. Investigators find his bloody fingerprints at the crime scene and they find his DNA inside of Meredith's body, as in they had sex. Also, his bloody fingerprint found on a cushion in Meredith's room, a fingerprint made with her blood, as in he was at least there after she died and he got her blood on his finger and then fled the fucking country. So probably there when she died, sure seems like he fucking killed her. Uh, and his DNA was found in the bathroom as well, you know, uh, where, the, where the Meredith's blood was. Almost as if he was trying to wash her blood off of him after definitely killing her and possibly raping her. Also, this is not in sources. I definitely feel like he left that turd in the toilet. Uh, and yet Amanda and Raffaele remain in custody because investigators, you know, just have such a hard on for this weird sex ritual murder or something thingy. Uh, Rudy now tells friends in early November that he is going to Milan. The police find him in Milan when he turns his phone on, but before arresting him, they lose him until he logs on later on Facebook and sends messages to several people, including journalists from the London Evening Standard and the Daily Telegraph. In one message, he said he was aware he was a suspect and wanted to turn himself in to clear his name. The papers gave this info to the police. Officers now trace his computer. Uh, before they're able to arrest him, Rudy tells a friend over an intercepted Skype call, the girl who's been killed, I met her the previous evening. The next day I went to her house, but we didn't do anything because neither of us had a condom. And so I went to the bathroom. After that, I heard screaming. See, this fucking probably that poop. After that, I heard screaming and I quickly came out of the bathroom. I saw this guy. I didn't see his face because it was dark. Then he ran. Why is it so dark in the fucking place? Then he ran out the front door. I saw Meredith who was bleeding. She had a cut on her throat. She was clinging on me strongly. I got scared. I was completely covered with blood. Fuck, I'm scared. I'll kill myself is what he says. Uh, to be clear, what he's saying here does not match up at all with the evidence of this crime uh, or like Meredith's autopsy. All right, he's saying that this random dude he can't identify, which is already just so suspicious to me, ran out of the house. Then after that, Meredith has a cut on her throat, but also still enough strength to strongly cling to him. But she died because someone made sure she couldn't breathe. All right, Italian forensic expert uh, Gian Stradi Norelli. A witness called by the Kircher family said that the main cause of Kircher's death was suffocation. Court documents said suffocation was caused by the hemorrhage following the neck wounds. Norelli said suffocation was also aided manually by forcing the victim's mouth and nose shut and by strangling her. And other experts have since agreed with Norelli. So she died from being suffocated, strangled, choked, whatever you know you want to call it. And she was still alive and not strangled when this dude ran out of the apartment. Then if Rudy is telling the truth about being at the apartment after she was stabbed, and she had the strength to cling. To, he must have killed her, right? Just by his own fucking words here. Also, Rudy tells his same friend that Amanda was not at the crime scene. So when he doesn't think anyone's listening, he says, nope, Amanda was not even at the crime scene. Don't know where she was. And then he'll flip on that later conveniently when pressured by investigators. Ah, <sighs> Because, you know, it helps like absolve him of some guilt. Uh, when Rudy Gaudet is then arrested in Germany, his story gets even more confusing. Now he says he was there uh, when Meredith was killed because she invited him over and they engaged in consensual foreplay. According to the Kircher family lawyer, Francesco Maresca, the walls of the vagina weren't lubricated. Therefore, it seems that there wasn't any desire on her part or participation. But that'll also be contradicted possibly later. Uh, Rudy claims that he has a stomach ache and is in the bathroom when Meredith is killed. Right again. Yeah, Maserati, Guido, Pinocchio, Jiminy, Crick, Raffredo. That's Italian for I fucking knew it. Right, the fucking turd. Uh, he said an Italian man now killed Meredith, but he really didn't see him. And how the fuck did he know he's Italian? Maybe he smelled strong the pastrami, lasagna, marinara, rotto, granato, mamma mia. Uh, Rudy now said he watched Meredith die. Meredith took hold of his hand, said something to him in her dying moments, but it was unintelligible. I know this is super sad right now, but based on what I said earlier, I just want to get, get this out of my head. When I first came across this, I did imagine him saying that her final words were, please, after I leave, flush the toilet. Uh, Rudy claims he now left the house and left Meredith's be bedroom door open. Says he left the front door half open. Uh, he went home, washed his hands, changed his clothes. I said I couldn't bear to stay in the house where there was still the nauseating smell of blood. Uh, and also couldn't bear to call the police, I guess. Rudy now goes to Domus, a student disco where he would be witnessed, stays there until 2.30 a.m. So he doesn't seem too busted up. Goes to a pub, stays there until 5 a.m. Clearly real sad about all this, needed to drink and dance the pain away. Next night also goes dancing, seems to be having a great time. Three witnesses even saw him continue to dance at 2 a.m. when the DJ called for a moment of silence for Meredith's uh, death and just uh, keeps on dancing through that moment of silence. So super cool guy. A few hours later, he gets on a train to Germany. Uh, later, Rudy uh, tells his defense team that he got into a fight with the killer, 
which he didn't say in the earlier, you know, uh, con uh, conversation, uh, story keeps changing. And he says, that's how he got a cut on his hand. Yes. Cause he did get a cut on his hand. Also, I didn't mention that the night Meredith died almost like maybe she was defending herself and caused him to cut himself with the knife. He probably used to stab the fuck out of her. Uh, he said of the mystery assailant. Now, all I know is that he was smaller than me and spoke Italian. Okay. So maybe he could know he's down. I didn't look properly at his face because I was looking at the knife earlier. He said it was too dark though. Ah, a lot of details keep changing. On the same day, Patrick Lumumba is released from custody after two weeks in prison. The police verified his alibi. Patrick said he spent the night uh, talking to a customer at his bar and the same customer verified this alibi completely. Things are falling apart for the prosecution when it comes to Amanda's supposed role in all of this. Oh, well, they just keep shoehorning her into different imaginative scenarios. She's a sex demon who convinced her boyfriend to help kill Meredith. Uh, but what about Rudy? How does he fit into this scenario? Well, let's follow the timeline a bit before I reveal what they came up with there. It's uh, not very clever. Uh, by the end of uh, my research into all of this, the stupidity of so many Italian officials working with the prosecution uh, just began to terrify me. December of 2007, Raffaele Celesero, uh, his prison diary is leaked to the press. He turned in the 40-page notebook to his lawyers. It was titled Notes on a Prison Journey. He wrote that Meredith's DNA was on the knife because they cooked together. Uh, excuse me, Amanda's DNA on the knife because they cooked together. Uh, the fact that Meredith's DNA on the kitchen knife is there is because, oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought I misread my notes. No, it is there. He says, the fact that there is Meredith's DNA on the kitchen knife is because once when we were all cooking together, I accidentally pricked her hand. I apologized immediately and said it was not a problem, right? So, okay. So Meredith uh, very likely may have been over at his house because she is, uh, you know, Amanda's friend, actually. They were not enemies. God, there's so many different fucking lies told about all of this. It gets hard to fucking track it all. Uh, Raffaele also wrote in his diary that Amanda may have framed him saying Amanda may have stitched me up by taking the knife and giving it to the son of a bitch who killed Meredith. I know it sounds like fiction, but it is possible. When I saw the knife on TV, that was in my kitchen and on which they found traces of Amanda and Meredith, my heart jumped into my throat. I was in a total panic because I thought Amanda killed Meredith or maybe helped someone kill her. But uh, Ziano, his lawyer, told me to keep calm and that there was no way it could be the murder weapon. This is like uh, living in some sort of nightmare reality show. Another entry. Thinking about the following day, I remember Amanda saying over and over that if she hadn't been with me that night, she would be dead. Reconstructing the events, I think she was with me, but I can't quite remember if she left me for a few minutes early on that evening. How can you not remember if you're with your lover all night or not? Uh, being coerced into a false confession, having false memories planted into your head by leading questions and statements and abusive interrogators, well, that's, that's one proven way. Uh, the same month, Rudy Gaudet is ex extradited to Italy. In December of 2007, prosecutors decide to keep Amanda in jail until her trial now. Uh, Mignini, genius prosecutor, real-life Italian Sherlock Holmes, interrogates Amanda about the kitchen knife found at Raffaele's house. When asked how her DNA was on the handle and Meredith's on the blade, she said, I don't know. I can't understand. And then eventually she exercised her right to keep silent. Amanda told her parents that she didn't know how the knife got from her house kitchen to Raffaele's house. And again, this knife will be found later to not even fucking be the knife that was used. Ah. <sighs> My God. Uh, January 10th, 2008, the police revealed that Raffaele Celesero's DNA is found on Meredith Kircher's bra clasp now. This was found in her room, uh, but also this bra clasp was not found until almost seven weeks after her body was found. It was found under a rug and it had apparently been cut off with a knife. How the fuck did it take this, this long to find it? It was, it was just under a rug, not hidden up in some ceiling air vent or, or stashed away by a, a killer in some, some kind of murder trophy box or something across town. Maybe it took this long because these investigators are fucking idiots. Like they're exceptionally bad at their jobs. Uh, this finding strengthened the prosecution's claim that it's, not, it's a broad class. It's not like a fucking hair. How did they not find this? This finding strengthened the prosecution's claims that Meredith was involved in a sex game with the suspects somehow, right? Here we go. Uh, the defense argues that the investigators contaminated the crime scene. And that was why Raffaele's DNA was found on this magically suddenly appearing now clasp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about Rudy? How does he fit into the prosecutor's sex game gone wrong theory? Well, now Mignini and his fucking Italian investigative A-team began to theorize that all three people were involved in some sort of sexual encounter where Meredith was the victim. Franco Maresca told Vanity Fair in 2008, certainly Rudy initiated the attack. Oh, certainly. And then because Meredith resisted the sexual violence, perhaps all of them were involved together. Or maybe after 20 seconds, Amanda intervened. She is in love with Rudy. Okay, they just made that up. In any event, it's homicide for all three. <sighs> There's no evidence that even uh, you know, points that they had a, like a, a lengthy conversation. This is, oh my God. 
or, you know, there's only like one person's uh, testimony that they even actually ever met before as far as Amanda and Rudy. Uh, Raffaele and Rudy both insisted they had never met each other. Rudy said he barely knew Amanda and his friends considered her a bitch. Nevertheless, uh, the prosecution will now claim that Amanda was fucking Raffaele and Rudy. Uh, they were basically her male sex slaves. And this nymphomaniac, evil sex fiend wanted more. She wanted Meredith to join in their devilish sex games slash sex rituals. You know, occult elements probably at play. And if Meredith doesn't want to play the game, then she has to die. This is a story they actually pushed. One of them, their own theory kept changing. They also thought that Meredith may have called Amanda out for being a slut in front of Raffaele and Rudy. And then Amanda decided she wasn't going to fucking take that disrespect. So she physically attacked Meredith. Uh, and then she commanded Raffaele and Rudy to help her attack and ended up commanding them to kill her after encouraging Rudy to rape her. And maybe also after encouraging uh, Raffaele to rape her. And Amanda may have also raped her. No evidence for any of this, but this is, this is all tossed around in the media and by the prosecution. July 11th, 2008, Amanda Knox, Rudy Gaudet, Raffaele Celestino, all charged with murder for their obvious sex ritual. Don't slut shame Amanda conflicting stories about killing situation thingy. Before the trial, three legal sources told various media outlets that Meredith's injuries were inconsistent with the knife blade, though. But who cares, right? Keep pushing the uh, sex fiend murder narrative. Also, it was not known if Meredith was raped, sexually assaulted with a foreign object or both. There are widespread rumors that her autopsy exam was a completely botched job. Yes, I would agree. Uh, to get a job with the legal system in Perugia, do you have to have uh, previously uh, worked for a circus in some kind of clowning capacity? In February of 2008, medical examiner uh, Luca Lali, working for the prosecution, declares that Meredith had no bruising to unequivocally prove sexual assault. But it was obvious that some sort of sexual activity had occurred before her death. Right. Even the prosecution's own uh, expert, not sure if she was raped or sexually assaulted, uh, may have had sexual uh, consensual sense, sex. My God, can't talk. Mamma mia. What a Laguini Lamborghini Cristofano Masante about a bing is going on here. Forget about it. Uh, Lolly was fired by Mignini shortly after making these comments. Right. Be part of my narrative or you're fired. Then another coroner's report from April of 2008 said that there was evidence of sexual activity for sure. Uh, but impossible to tell whether it was consensual or not. Then before the trial, Rudy Gaudet changes his testimony yet again. Now claims he saw Raffaele on the night of November 1st and saw Amanda Knox standing at the door of her place. The circus continues. September 6, 2008, Rudy Gaudet requests a fast track trial because he fears that Amanda and Raffaele will join together against him in their testimony. Well, yeah, they probably will. They'll tell the truth and that won't be good for him. Uh, October 28th, 2008, Rudy Gaudet is sentenced to 30 years in prison. His fast track situation didn't work out too well for him. At his trial, he testified that he saw the silhouette of Amanda Knox leaving the house. Right, did he see that or is he just trying to throw off blame away from himself? And that'll hurt Amanda at her trial. January 16th, 2009, Amanda and Raffaele, uh, double murder trial. Their double murder trial. Their double murder trial begins. And it will last for damn near a year. Uh, six months in on June 11, 2009, Amanda Knox finally testifies in her own defense for six hours. At first, she spoke in English with an Italian translator. After an hour, she switched over to Italian. She had a lot of time to practice it. She testified that on the night of November 1st, she and Raffaele were at his house. She checked her email, read Harry Potter, watched Amelie, smoked weed, had sex, fell asleep. She denied that she and Meredith didn't get along and insisted uh, that she only signed the confession blaming uh, Lumumba because she was under abusive pressure to do so by the police. Amanda testified when she got home on November 2nd that the door was open. There were drops of blood in the bathroom sink. She thought it was strange. Maybe one of her roommates left in a rush, right? The same thing she said earlier. Took her earrings out, put them on the sink, then took a shower, saw the bath mat, stained in blood, then saw feces, big old turd, in the second toilet, went to get Raffaele. Then she and Raffaele, her roommates, some friends, and the police all got to the house at around the same time when they knocked down or the door. She heard her roommate call out a foot, a foot, right? All the stuff we've heard before. And then she uh, began to cry. Amanda testified that she was confused and distressed during her interrogation, saying the declarations were taken against my will. Everything was said under confusion and pressure of the police and prosecutor. They were suggesting the path of thought. I was confused. I kept saying I had nothing to do with this. And I remember being at Raffaele's apartment. They kept yelling at me. I was in a state of confusion because for hours, they just kept calling me a stupid liar, demanding that I remember, remember, remember. Amanda also claimed that the police hit her on the head repeatedly, right? Which they denied. And she explained that the press took some of the uh, of her actions the wrong way. Uh, also, she was in shock after Meredith was killed, which made her act strangely. Right? Very possible. September 27, 2009, the final witnesses testify at the trial. 
Uh, on November 18th, 2009, Rudy Gaudet, already having his first appeal heard before Amanda and Raffaele's trial is done, uh, makes a statement claiming that Amanda and Meredith Kircher got into an argument now right before a murder. He just conveniently remembers this all of a sudden. Uh, Rudy's sentence is reduced now from 30 to 16 years. Interesting. It is speculated that he was given a deal, tell the court whatever will help the prosecution for their trial against Amanda and Raffaele, and will shave off roughly half your sentence. These corrupt fucks. De- December 4th, 2009, Amanda Knox and Raffaele Celestito, Celestito, after all this, are convicted of murder. The jury deliberated for 13 hours. And this jury, I found out, very different than a U.S. jury. In Italy, there is actually uh, no trial by peers. That's not an option. Usually trials are decided in Italy by monkeys. Uh, if a majority of monkeys throw more than half of their shit, at least 10 feet across courtroom, defendant's guilty. If majority of monkeys eat at least all their shit, at least if they eat all their shit on any given day during the trial, case is thrown out. Mamma mia, I gotta go home. Uh, the monkeys eat the shit. Uh. Oh, praise be uh, Saint Alfa Romeo, Porsche Nocchi. No. Usually the trial is decided by a panel of judges. But for very serious crimes like Amanda's, there are two judges appointed to the trial and six citizens. And they decide together. Uh, the U.S. sequesters juries during a trial of this no- uh, level of notoriety. Italy does not. So those presiding over the case are listening to the media, you know, as much as they want to, taking in all this info from many different angles, uh, not just in the courtroom. Uh, and, you know, the all the Italian media, right? They're eating up the sex game gone wrong angle with Foxy Noxy. So they're hearing that. Also in the U.S., a decision in a murder trial has to be unanimous. Not in Italy. Just needs to be a majority. All right. So there's eight. There's five of them got to agree. And that's uh, the, de- the decision. And finally, in Italy, the prosecutor and judge work together in investigations in addition to presiding then over court proceedings. So a judge is likely to be very prejudiced after reading the full investigative report to begin the trial, especially if it implies the defendant's guilt, which prosecutor, uh, you know, Giuliano Mignini's report certainly did. Uh, Amanda is shocked by the guilty verdict. When the judge announces that she and Raffaele are guilty, she says, no, no, no. Her first thoughts are, this is impossible. This is impossible. This is a nightmare. This can't be true. It's not fair. It's not fair. She later wrote in her memoir, my life cleaved in two. Before the verdict, I'd been a wrongly accused college student about to walk free. I was about to start my life over after two years. Now everything I'd thought had been promised had been ripped away. Uh, Amanda sentenced to 26 years. Raffaele is sentenced to 25. Amanda was given that extra year because she lied about her boss being the one who killed Meredith and was ordered to pay Patrick Lumumba 60,000 euros for defamation. That's fucking crazy. The police feed her a bullshit story. She gives in, agrees to it. He's later exonerated thanks to an alibi. And then she's punished more. She's given an extra year in prison and ordered to pay him 60,000. Amanda and Raffaele are also ordered to pay a million euros to both of Meredith's parents and 800,000 euros to her siblings. Amanda had to be carried out of the courtroom by her arms. Amanda's lawyer, Carlos, stopped her and told her, I'm so sorry, we're going to win. We're going to win, Amanda. We're going to save you, be strong. Less than two months later, January 21st, 2010, prosecutor Giuliano Magnini, he is convicted of abuse of office for wiretapping journalists and law enforcement. Huh, what? This guy? Italian Sherlock Holmes? How shocking. He receives a sentence of 16 months. Amanda's legal team said that this called into question how fair of a trial that she received. Right, she received, uh, received, and check this shit out. This is fucking wild. The Menini conviction had to do with the Monster of Florence case, a series of murders in the 70s and 80s believed to be uh, carried out by a serial killer. Maybe need to suck that case someday. Anyway, Menini supposedly, quote, learned that a doctor from Perugia, Francesco Narducci, uh, might have been killed in relation to the Monster of Florence case. His death back in 1985 was ruled a drowning, but Menini, he sees things that others cannot see. He is the Italian Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he orders an exhumation, uh, exhumation of the body, believing he was murdered. In 2006, American author Doug Preston was interrogated by Menini about this same case. The Italian journalist, who was his co-author, was also put in jail by Menini after they both published a book criticizing Menini for his theory in this monster of Florence investigation. Basically, they said he was a fucking crazy idiot. That he was full of shit and that his theory was paranoid insanity. And cause, cause, because his theory, Menini believed this is a fucking prosecutor truly believed that a secret satanic cult commissioned local farmers to steal female genitals for rituals connected to the monster of Florence. What a, what a brilliant mind. 
riled up over being mocked relentlessly about his stupid fucking theory that no one else believed, Mignini then leaked confidential information and wiretapped judges, police, and journalists who criticized him. He is a fucking clown. Someone prone to sensationalize shit and see a dramatic story where there is not one. Like I definitely think he did with Amanda Knox. And he is sadly not the only clown amongst the Italian authorities. Uh, June 1st, 2010, Amanda appears in court again. Uh, uh, she, uh, now she faces slander charges for claiming that the police hit her t- during the interrogation. For saying that they hit her, now she's slandering them. Uh, and she will not be acquitted of this bullshit charge until January 14th, 2016. November 24th, 2010, Amanda and Raffaele uh, begin their appeal, appealing their convictions. Amanda will break down on the witness stand the following month and say, in court, I have been condemned for the crime I did not commit. January 22nd, 2011, two forensic experts from Rome sworn in to retest the forensic evidence used against Amanda. They plan to look at the knife and Meredith's bra clasp, right? Used against Amanda and Raffaele. And Dr. Carla Avecchiati, one of the independent experts we met earlier, right? Told the Amanda Knox documentary producers that Raffaele and two unknown male DNA profiles were all found on the bra clasp. The police did not note that as evidence. There was also contamination in the lab where the class was concerned, because of course it was. Amanda's profile was de- uh, definitively identified on the kitchen knife, but again, as I said earlier, this knife, you know, ends up being proven not even to be the knife that was used, and Meredith's DNA sample on the knife was so small, it was highly likely that it was due there to contamination. Uh, yeah, just fucking, all this is just such garbage. Mamma mia! Uh, February 15th, 2011, Amanda Knox's parents, now they're indicted for libeling the police in Perugia. Kurt Knox, Ed Amelis, accused of defamation for their statements to the Sunday Times, a London paper in 2009. How dare they say that these police are idiots when they are for sure idiots. Uh, on June 27, 2011, Amanda Knox and Raffaele Celestito's appeal process begins. Rudy Gaudet refuses to testify that Amanda Knox was not involved in the murder of Meredith Kircher, even though that's what he told his fucking friend when he didn't think people were listening to begin with. Uh, the prosecutor read a letter stating that Rudy thought Amanda and Raffaele uh, murdered Meredith instead. Uh, Rudy also denies that he told another inmate that Amanda and Raffaele were innocent. The defense argued that Gade's letter was just based on a feeling, not facts or eyewitness testimony. Amanda testified the only time that Rudy Gade, Raffaele, Celestito, and I were in the same room together was in a courtroom. He knows what the truth is. I don't know what happened that night. June 29, 2011, forensic specialists testified to the court that the DNA evidence on the knife was unsound. <sighs> Amanda's DNA, right? I, I'm not gonna go through it all. It's fucking the same shit. It's like more and more people keep proving, nope, this is not what they said it was initially. July 25th, 2011, two expert witnesses now testified that the knife and <laughs> ledge murder weapon have no blood on it now. Now they're saying that there's no blood on it. And that there's, and they say, these other uh, experts now say that there was no DNA on the bra class. So it's, not only was it not contaminated, it just, it's just not there. What the fuck is even happening in this process? <laughs> Are these experts actually experts? The experts also testify that the forensic scientists who worked the initial case made critical errors. Based on the errors, the evidence against Amanda and Raffaele is all, should all be inadmissible. September 26, 2011, the lawyers for the civil parties present their final statements. The Kircher family lawyer presents photos of Meredith's body. Patrick Lumumba's lawyer, so fucking random, accuses Amanda now of having an angelic, good, compassionate side and a Lucifer-like, demonic, satanic side. Okay, and, and how is she satanic? That's never made clear. Did all this take place like just over a decade ago or several centuries ago? On October 3rd, 2011, the appeals court overturns Amanda Knox and Raffaele Celestito's convictions. So hail Nimrod, finally, before the verdict, Raffaele says to the court, I have never harmed anyone, never in my life. Amanda made her statement next. It was said many times that I'm a different person from the way I look and that people cannot figure out who I am. I'm the same person I was four years ago. I've always been the same. The only difference is what I suffered in four years. I lost a friend in the most brutal, inexplicable way. My trust in the police has been betrayed. I had to face absolutely unjust charges, accusations, and I'm paying with my life for something that I did not do. Four years ago, I was four years younger, but fundamentally, I was younger because I had never suffered. I didn't know what tragedy was. It was something I would watch on television that didn't have anything to do with me. I am not what they say I am. The perversion, the violence, the spite for life are not a part of me. And I didn't do what they say I did. I didn't kill. I didn't rape. I didn't steal. I was not there. I wasn't present at this crime, right? And the whole like rape, steal, she was accused of everything. And then Amanda said, I want to go home. I want to go back to my life. I don't want to be punished, deprived of my life and future for something I didn't do because I'm innocent. Raffaele is innocent. We deserve freedom. We didn't do anything not to deserve it. 
I have great respect for this court. I doubt it. Uh, for the care shown during our trial. Well, oh yeah, maybe this recent court. So I thank you. Amanda's slander conviction against Patrick Lumumba is not overturned. She is sentenced to three years, but time served and still uh, given a 29,000 euro fine for fuck's sake. Amanda and Raffaele briefly returned to prison to collect their things and are released. Amanda wrote, I came out of the same door I'd gone through four years before. I remember to brush my right foot against the ground, the prison ritual to pass on freedom to another prisoner. As Amanda walked out of the prison, inmates cheered for her shouting, freedom, Amanda, you're going home. Uh, But also when she was given her freedom outside of the court, people were chanting shame, 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 shame. They were convinced, overwhelming majority convinced she was guilty still. October 4th, 2011, Amanda Knox flies back to Wash after almost four years in prison and then gives a brief homecoming speech saying, fuck Italy. That whole third world shithole can suck my fucking dick. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Uh, After all she'd been through, she still loved Italy. She said, my family is reminding me to speak in English because I'm having problems with that. I'm really overwhelmed right now. I was looking down from the airplane and it seemed like everything wasn't real. What's important for me to say is just thank you to everyone who has believed in me, who has defended me, who supported my family. My family is the most important thing to me right now. and I just want to go and be with them. So thank you for being there for me. When Amanda finally got home after spending some time recuperating, uh, letting the media interest in her die down a bit, she ended up moving into an apartment and then a house. Uh, she dated, she got a job at a bookstore and would go on walks at night to avoid being constantly photographed and harassed. In 2021, Amanda told the New York Times, I felt like I couldn't even try to have a normal life because I was carrying this shroud over me. In part, I was defiant. I felt like there was this deep injustice, so I didn't change my name. I didn't change my appearance, but I also felt defeated, that there was nothing I could do about it. After Amanda returned to the U.S., uh, her sister Deanna spoke with ABC about the harassment Amanda experienced in prison. Uh, When she was visiting Amanda, she saw the message, Amanda is a whore, written around the prison. Amanda reported that a male guard entered her cell alone, made sexual comments to her. Another prison official ordered Amanda to come to his office at night, wanted to discuss sexual acts with her. That all sounds about right. Prison doctors also lied to Amanda, apparently, after her arrest and told her that she tested positive for HIV. Amanda wrote about her uh, seven sex partners, ye, oh my, in her diary, and that list would be leaked to the press and the tabloid twisted the story to say that she had sex with seven men in two months. And if she did, who fucking gives a shit? But at least it was all over, right? Well, wrong. No, less than a year and a half after being released on appeal on March 26, 2013, the Court of Cassation, the Supreme Court in Italy, reopens the case and overturns the acquittal. At the time, Amanda had returned to her home in Seattle, right? Was scheduled to publish her memoir. Her lawyer announced that she was upset and surprised, but ready to prove her innocence. On September 30, 2013, Amanda and Raffaele's retrial begins in Florence now without Amanda or Raffaele being present. Yeah, no fucking way Amanda is heading back to Italy at this time after that bullshit. On December 17, 2013, Amanda Knox's lawyer presents a written statement from Amanda to the court saying, I must repeat to you, I'm innocent. I did not rape. I did not steal. I did not kill Meredith. It's insane that she has to even fucking state those things. January 30th, 2014, Amanda Knox and Raffaele Selecito are convicted of fucking murder again. The jury deliberated by 11 and a half hours. Judge added two and a half years to Amanda's sentence, increased it from 26 years to 28 now. Uh, Raffaele, resentenced to 25 years, uh, forced to surrender his passport. He'll be able to remain free while his appeal is heard, though. The court releases a lengthy document stating that the evidence showed more than one person murdered Meredith. They didn't. Amanda said she will never go back to Italy willingly and fears being extradited. Luckily, the U.S. government is on her side because this case, you know, it's a fucking joke. May 1st, 2014, Amanda Knox now speaks with CNN, maintains her innocence, says that there was no forensic evidence to prove she was in Meredith's room that night. There was none of her DNA, hair, footprints, handprints, nothing. And that's all true. March 27th, 2015, after another appeal, now the court of cassation, the, the Supreme Court, overturns the two murder convictions because of lack of evidence. Amanda's defamation conviction (laughs) is upheld, though. Ah. With his final ruling, the murder case is finally officially closed. Amanda sat outside her mom's house or sat outside her mom's house and said, I am incredibly grateful for what has happened, for the justice I've received, for the support that I've had from everyone, from my family, from my friends, to strangers, to people like you. You saved my life. Right now, I'm still absorbing what all this means. What comes to mind is my gratitude for the life that's been given to me. In September, the court releases their explanation for their latest decision. They claimed that the case was, quote, marked by culpable omissions of investigative activity, right? They weren't looking at the right fucking people, uh, contradictory evidence, because mm-hmm, they just pulled it out of their ass, and stunning flaws in the investigation. 
And they also said the unusual media hype caused a sudden acceleration in the investigation. The police's rush to find suspects certainly did not assist in finding the truth. And the court noted that there was no blood in the kitchen knife. <laughs> ah, no DNA on the bra clasp and the knife was scientifically unreliable. As in, it was not the right knife. The court found, in the end, a complete lack of biological evidence connecting Amanda and Raphael to the crimes. Complete lack. The court also said that evidence still pointed to Rudy Gaudet being guilty. How the fuck did they not come to this conclusion? The first fucking time they looked at this case and again found Amanda guilty. Uh, 2013, uh, Raffaele writes his book, Honor Bound, My Journey to Hell and Back with Amanda Knox. In April of 2016, Raffaele begins a career as a TV expert on crimes for TGCOM24, an Italian media outlet. He tells the Times in, UK, in the UK, I've been a victim of a miscarriage of justice. I know the faults of the justice system, what happens in a jail, and what happens when the media twists the truth. The usual expats on these shows have seen these things through a window. I have lived them. And I believe he's still doing that now, that kind of a, that type of career. In 2015, Amanda Knox meets her husband, Christopher Robinson. Uh, when she interviews him about his novel, The War of the Encyclopedists, for the West Seattle Herald, Robinson decided that the, uh, he wouldn't Google Amanda's name and let her tell her own story. He proposed to Amanda in November of 2018 with a meteor, saying, I don't have a ring, but I do have a big rock. Will you stay with me until the last star in the last galaxy burns out? That's pretty good. And then, after, and then even after that, Amanda Marie Knox, will you marry me? Uh, Amanda and Christopher get married in December 7th, 2018. She was able to keep this wedding a secret until the summer of 2019. Amanda said in August of that year, we filed paperwork to be legally married in December of last year to simplify our taxes and insurance. Amanda and her husband currently run Knox Robinson Pub, uh, Productions. They publish a poetry, poetry collection titled the, or the published one, titled The Cardio Tesseract. And they also host two podcasts, Labyrinths and The Truth About True Crime. On October 25th, 2018, Amanda released the first episode of her podcast, The Truth About True Crime, in collaboration with Sundance TV. And on October 16th, 2020, Amanda Knox released the first episode of Labyrinths, a podcast that highlights stories of getting lost and found again through compassionate interviews, philosophical rants, and playful debate with fascinating people. Expect dark and hilarious misadventures, nagging and controversial questions, and above all, expect to arrive at unexpected places. On January 24, 2019, the European Court of Human Rights ordered Italy to pay Amanda Knox over $20,000 in damages for failing to provide a lawyer and interpreter when she was first detained. Oh boy, $20,000 after all that. Yippee. June 13, 2019, Amanda returns to Italy for the conference, for a conference with the Italian Innocence Project at the Festival on Criminal Justice. That's pretty ballsy. Uh, Amanda spoke on June 15th and said, I know that despite my acquittal, I remain a controversial figure for the public opinion, especially in Italy. I know that many people think I am bad, that I don't belong here. It shows how a false narrative can be powerful and undermine justice, especially when amplified by the media. Uh, Amanda and Christopher Robinson have their wedding ceremony, February 29th, 2020. December 4th, 2020, a court rules that Rudy Gaudet will be able to finish his sentence performing community service. That's fucked up. He's given partial release, that fucking dirtbag, in 2017. August 4th, 2021, Amanda Knox announces on the Labyrinth podcast that she is pregnant. October 22nd, 2021, uh, Amanda and Christopher announced the birth of their daughter, Eureka Muse Knox Robinson. Amanda posted a picture of herself and her baby and said it would be the only picture of her daughter that she was ever going to post on social media. She said, since my exoneration, I've struggled to reclaim my identity and protect the people I love from being exploited as tabloid content. It's not easy. And I often feel like I'm trying to invent good choices out of bad whole cloth. I know that I cannot 100% protect my daughter from the kind of treatment I've suffered, but I'm doing the best I can, which is why this will be the only picture of her I will ever share on social media. I'm so grateful to everyone who has wished uh, my husband and I well in our journey to parenthood. Thank you for believing in us. On November 23rd, 2021, 34-year-old Rudy Gaudet finishes his sentence and he was supposed to be released in January of 2020, yeah, of 2022, uh, but was granted early release. Over the past year of community service, uh, he worked with the charity Caritas and worked as a librarian at the Viterbo, excuse me, Criminological Studies Center. Um, excuse me, teacher at the center said that Rudy wanted to be forgotten, and that will take us out of our timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. What a case, huh? A lot of information, and it's just there's so much conflicting information. It just gets uh, a little muddy 
but hopefully I streamlined it enough for it to make sense. Uh, before I share some final thoughts about all of this, I do have one more in-show sponsor for today. Time Suck is brought to you today by my new side hustle, the world's greatest Italian language instruction course, the Dan Cummins Italian Masterclass. In just one one-hour lesson, for only uh, somewhere between five and forty thousand dollars, call for details. I'll make sure you can speak Italian as well as I do, quickly teaching you how to perfectly speak popular Italian phrases like "Where is the nearest bathroom?" Pepperoni, mozzarella, Penelope Cruz, Bugatti, and uh, where can I find some tacos? Ferrari, Luigi, Minestrone, Tony Bagadonas, Mafia, Bang Bang, <laughs> or where is the Roman Colosseum? Eggplant, Parmesan, Gorgonzola, Versace, Asiago, Tortellini, Antonio Banderas. And finally, for just this uh, little taste of what I can give you, what Tom Cruise movie is your favorite? Rita Moreno, Ivo Langeria, Gianna Legazamo, Pancho Villa, Spaghetti, That's a Spice of Meat for Mamma Mia, Mission Impossible, Ronald Habara, Issa So Crazy, Octopus, Linguini, Casey Anthony. Fucking nailed it. And you can too. With the Dan Cummins Italian, Ma- Italian Masterclass. Sign up today by calling 1 800 Forget About It! Okay, uh, back, I guess, to this episode's story. Uh, seriously, what a case. Now I just want to keep talking in that stupid fucking voice. Uh, the prosecutor, uh, Giuliana Mignini, what a fucking piece of shit. Uh, he just seems so determined to punish Amanda and Raffaele. Investigative bias, a type of unconscious bias in which an investigator or auditor fails to seek, see, use, or share relevant information or records. Menini seemed to have this, maybe not unconscious though. And confirmation bias, a tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs or theories. Uh, he seemed to be so biased, used a lot of cognitive distance, it seems, to anything that didn't line up with his fucking wild theories, just uh, completely ignore all of that. It was like based on how she behaved, based on what he thought of her sexual morality, uh, Giuliano just got it into his imaginative prone head, as we found out, uh, to formulate these wild theories that Amanda Knox was a sex maniac who killed Meredith because she wouldn't either willingly participate in some sex games that there's no fucking evidence of, or because she uh, dared to judge Amanda over her supposedly deviant sexual predilections, which also he just pulled out of thin air. No evidence supported any of that. Nothing. But nonetheless, he fed that theory to the tabloids and they fucking ran with it. He employed a lot of cognitive dissonance right again to perpetually just discount more and more evidence that pointed towards Amanda's innocence as time went on, pointed towards Rudy Gaudet's guilt. And then sadly, the jury who convicted Amanda that had not been sequestered, right? They were surrounded with the false narrative that he fucking put out there. Uh, Raphael, you know, Raphael Selecito's knife, not conclusively the murder weapon. Meredith's DNA likely got into contamination, even if it was. Amanda's fingerprints, DNA, not all over Meredith's bedroom, mixed with her blood. Neither was, as was determined in the end, uh, Selechito's, but Rudy Gaudet's was. His DNA was inside Meredith. He had also just stolen a kitchen knife in a break-in days before Meredith was killed that he had in his fucking backpack, right? Days before someone sure seemed to uh, break into her place. He'd seen Meredith around. He was familiar with her. He very likely had talked to her on a few occasions, liked her. He was a known thief, known break-in artist, whatever. And in the end, he was the only one whose murder conviction was not overturned. But still, years after the murder, and this is from an article just from a few months ago, this Mignini in a, uh, you know, said that uh, uh, Rudy could not have acted alone in killing Meredith because, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. He, he, he's still holding on to his belief that uh, a man has uh, you know, something to do with this. But years after the murder, this was several years ago in a BBC documentary, I love this. He said that Rudy could not have acted alone in killing Meredith. That's how he knows other people were involved because Meredith knew karate. That's how done this guy's, right? She took a a fucking, she she went up like two belts. She took a few karate classes back in her younger years. And now it is impossible, according to this guy, for Rudy to overpower her alone because she's this fucking martial arts master. Taking a couple karate classes does not mean you know how to street fight. You know, testing for your third belt, a little bit different than fighting off a rapist or other attacker in real life, especially someone who's stronger than you, bigger than you. Come on, dude. Uh, Giuliano said multiple attackers had to have attacked Meredith, but that's not true at all. Wild speculation. Said the two knives were were used. That's just more speculation. Uh, In the end, he wasn't sure of almost anything about this murder trial. You know, thank God that Rudy Gaudet left a whole bunch of fucking evidence all around the murder scene or they would have never fucking nailed him. 
Uh, he had two scared college kids abusively interrogated without lawyers present. People give false confessions all the time in scenarios like that. And then the confession Knox gave about Patrick Lumumba proven not to be true. He's released fairly quickly. Thanks to an alibi. And, you know, again, come on in the end, Italy, Italy's Supreme court finally says the case is marked by culpable emissions of investigative activity, contradictory evidence, stunning flaws, not just flaws, stunning flaws in the investigation, you know, unusual media hype caused a sudden acceleration in the investigation. And that media hype was caused by Giuliano Menini. That fucker should be in prison right now. The police's rush to find suspects certainly did not assist in finding the truth. He was in charge of the investigation. Uh, the court also noted, right, that there was no blood uh, on the fucking knife. On and on and on and on. I'm not going to go over all the stuff because I've gone over it so many times. Uh, that dipshit, what I was trying to say earlier, to this day, still believes Knox was at the scene of the murder. That just from a, an article a few months ago. Thankfully, he retired, but not until 2020. And sadly, he still works as a consultant, a legal consultant. Even though his career was plagued by so many other allegations of abuse I didn't go over and by other convictions regarding abusing his power that I didn't go over. Okay, so after all that, what do you think about this? I realize I'm biased, obviously, into thinking Amanda and Raffaele had nothing to do with Meredith's murder. But I'm biased based on the facts of this case. It was a fucking shit show of epic proportions, a very sloppy, very poorly conducted sham of an investigation. And sadly, so many people are still convinced that Amanda killed Meredith Kircher or at least was complicit in her murder, right? How sad. Already so tragic that Meredith was murdered. She was, by all accounts, a wonderful young woman who would have had a very bright future ahead of her had she not been brutally killed. Extra tragic that two innocent people had years of their lives stolen from them and their names forever tarnished over nothing more than a lot of bad investigative work. This case is a good reminder for me of innocent until proven guilty. And sometimes still innocent after being proven guilty, right? Because the media, uh, just because they all believe someone commits a crime doesn't mean that they did. Just because investigators are convinced someone commits a crime doesn't mean that they did. Just because a jury convicts someone doesn't mean they did, right? Journalists, prosecutors, police officers, uh, you know, jurists, all just fallible meat sacks like me and you and everybody else. We all make mistakes. And sometimes, unfortunately, a bunch of us make the same mistakes about the same thing at the same time. And the truth really takes a beating and innocent people really get hurt. And that's what I think happened here. Uh, send in some messages to Bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com if you disagree or if you think I missed something extra important or have some uh, extra info to share. And sorry for thinking you did it, Amanda Knox. Uh, I hope more people start to think otherwise and see you as a victim of injustice and not a perpetrator of injustice. And I hope you have so much fun with what sounds like that wonderful husband of yours and that beautiful little girl of yours. After what you've been through, I bet you will be a wonderfully, uh, wonderfully protective and wise mother. Hail Nimrod, and time for today's takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. A number one. Uh, Armando Knox, I wasn't 20 years old. Uh, what you... <laughs> no, that would suck. Uh, when she, she was 20 years old when she moved to Italy for a year of studying abroad. She lived in a house with three other young women in the beautiful city of Perugia. A month into her semester, she met her boyfriend, Raffaele Selecito. After just one week of dating, their relationship came to a tragic and unexpected end when they were accused of murder and arrested. Number two, Meredith Kircher's dead body was found inside her locked bedroom. On the afternoon of November 2nd, 2007, Meredith's foot was poking out from her blanket. She had likely been sexually assaulted and stabbed 47 times. Rudy Gaudet's DNA was found inside her body. His fingerprints found in her room, and uh, he claimed that he and Meredith had had a consensual sexual encounter. And when he went to the bathroom, she was attacked by an unknown man. And I fucking doubt it. Uh, Rudy is the one person sent to prison for murder, murdering Meredith that I agree should have been sent to prison. Number three, Amanda's DNA was found on a knife handle and Meredith's DNA on the same knife's blade. The knife belonged to Raffaele Selecito. Amanda's DNA also found mixed with Meredith's blood in the bathroom sink. Uh, but this was found out to be likely probably from saliva on the sink when the blood dropped on there. Uh, Raffaele's uh, DNA detected on Meredith's bra class when it was found seven weeks after, uh, after her death, despite the seemingly strong forensic evidence at the time, uh, this was all eventually proven to be, you know, uh, a result of contamination at the crime scene or uh, actually that the blood was never even on these items and just all the results of so many errors made by the Italian police. Number four, Amanda was portrayed as a promiscuous girl who vengefully murdered Meredith when she wouldn't participate in a sex game with herself, Raffaele, and Rudy Gaudet. The tabloids ran with that story, digging into Amanda's private sex life, publishing details for millions of people to see. Even the judge and prosecutors, who were supposed to focus only on the facts of the case, were heavily influenced by their views of Amanda's promiscuity. 
Seven partners. Ooh, that's all she'd be linked to. Hardly a sex fiend. And again, this was all based on just a bunch of nonsense and lies. Number five, new info. One aspect of the case that we didn't really cover was the impact of the trial on Amanda's family. Amanda's long divorced parents split the rent on an apartment near the prison Amanda would spend, you know, roughly four years in. The family arranged their schedules so that someone would always be in Italy to be with Amanda. And I think that's so fucking cool. They used almost all of their home equity and retirement funds to pay for Amanda's lawyers, experts, investigators, and a media advisor. They had to accept additional money from their families. Kurt Knox would tell the Seattle Times a bit before this was all over. It's called being leveraged to the hilt. Literally, we have nothing and we'll do whatever it takes. Their legal costs ended up exceeding a million dollars. Uh, in spring of 2008, Tom Wright, the father of one of Amanda's high school classmates named Sarah, uh, founded Friends of Amanda to help the family out. Amanda had written a note in Sarah's yearbook saying that if anything happened to her and she needed help, she would pick Sarah to help her. Well, Sarah told her dad they needed to do something. And he founded the group. So awesome. Hail Nimrod. They raised $80,000 for Amanda's case. Friends of Amanda reached out to families of Seattle prep students to raise money for her legal fees and maintain a website devoted to the truth about Amanda and the charges against her. Coworkers donated their vacation, excuse me, and sick days to Amanda's family. Uh, others donated airline miles. The New York Times reported that while it was rumored Amanda received a $3.8 million advance for her memoir, she had to pay off so many legal bills, mortgages for her family, loan for her sister, Deanna, agent fees, taxes. In the end, she had about 200000 left. So glad that in the end, Amanda was able to help her family recoup a lot of their losses. Still a sad story. An innocent young woman was tragically murdered, but a bit of a happy note to end on. To see a family, a split family do everything they could to be there for their daughter, their sister, even friends joining in. If any of us ever get put to the ringer like Amanda was, I hope we at least get the same kind of support from family and friends that she did. Maybe the lone bright spot in all of this. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Amanda Knox and the murder of Meredith Kircher has been sucked. Thank you for listening. Thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all their help in making time suck. Thanks to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, the art warlock, Logan Keith for producing. Oh, actually, gosh dang it. I uh, should have corrected that. Our suck ranger, Tyler C, producing and directing today. And uh, uh, Logan, you know, uh, I'm helping with production in, I don't even know the fucking time. My brain's dying right now. Thanks to Ben Elixir. It was Tyler. Tyler produced today's show. Thanks also to Ben Elixir for upkeep on the Time Suck app, the art warlock, Logan Keith, for creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com and for helping run our socials along with our Suck Ranger and a team managed by social media strategist, Ryan Handelsman. And thanks to every member of our numerous online communities on Facebook, Reddit, and Discord. Next week on Time Suck, my Italian fluency continues to pay off. We return to the Italian peninsula to suck Julius Caesar. I know he spoke Latin, but as a master linguist, I know the Latin pretty similar to Italian. So it's going to come in very handy. Anyway, Julius Caesar was born in 100 BCE, assassinated March 15th, 44 BCE. During his 56 years, Caesar would serve as a brilliant but ruthless military leader and politician. He started his career in politics and as a young man initially used bribes and generous gifts to secure alliances. He would eventually declare himself dictator for life. Caesar, most notable for leading the conquest of Gaul, forming the first triumvirate the, uh, with Pompey the Great and Marcus Licinius Crassus and for his affair with Cleopatra. Caesar's triumvirate uh, gave him a strong political ally in the, and uh, the richest man in, in Rome. Uh, Caesar's success caused tensions within the triumvirate and I'm going to work on how to say that fucking word harder for next week. After Crassus died, this triumvirate broke down and Pompey turned on Caesar and tried to force him to give up his army. In response, Caesar started a civil war by crossing the border into Rome with his army. He pursued Pompey all the way to Egypt. And after Pompey was killed, Caesar helped Cleopatra steal the throne from her brother slash co-ruler, King Ptolemy the 13th. Caesar returned to Rome and was declared dictator for 10 years. But two years later in 44 BCE, declared himself dictator for life. Caesar's enemies feared that with his power and popularity within the Rome, with the Roman public, he was on his way to becoming a king and stealing their power. A group of Romans conspired to kill Caesar. And on March 15th, 44 BCE, Caesar was assassinated in the Roman Senate house. But Caesar's power and legacy would continue even after his death. Rome was thrown into more political chaos and another civil war, which led to the end of the Roman Republic. Caesar's grandnephew and heir Octavian would emerge victorious and become the first emperor of Rome. We'll cover the fall of the Roman Republic, Julius Caesar's life and death, complex political alliances, affairs, betrayal, a lot of tough to pronounce words, and so much more next week on Time Suck. Right now, let's head on over to this week's uh, a Time Suck Updates, uh, a Spaghetti Antonio Banderas, uh, 
blah, 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 blah. Get your time, sucker updates. First update from a fellow sucker, also obsessed with righteous vengeance. Very cool story, I think. Top shelf deputy sack Tyler writes, Dear Dan the Prophet and Nimrod, Herald of the great and powerful Triple M, favored ball thrower of the good boy Bojangles, and Lucifina's illustrious pool boy. I am a patrol deputy in a mostly rural parish in South Louisiana. I'll keep the name of that parish to myself to protect the probably guilty. Love it. After listening to the Bayou Strangler and the murder of Dee Dee Blanchard, the two Louisiana Bay sucks, knowing your love of merciless retribution when it comes to child predators, I felt compelled to tell you about the story of Jody Plouchet and uh, Jeff Doucette. Stop me if you've heard this one. I don't, I, it sounded familiar, but I don't, I didn't remember all the details. On February 19th, 1984, 11 year old Jody Plouchet was abducted by his 25 year old karate instructor and close family friend, Jeff Doucette. Jeff and Jody boarded a bus heading towards the West Coast where Jeff would dye Jody's hair, shave his own beard to conceal his identity, and attempt to pass Jody off as his own son. After checking into a small motel room in Anaheim, California, Jeff began to sexually abuse his karate student. This continued until Jody asked to contact his parents, which Jeff allowed. Authorities were able to trace the call and apprehend Jeff and send Jody back to his parents. Jody's parents, like many of us, were devastated to find out Jeff, their trusted family friend, had not only abducted their son, but were mortified to find out their son had been abused at his hands. Jody's father, Gary Plouchet, took it especially hard saying, I'm going to kill that son of a bitch. And then on March 16th, 1984, Jeff Doucette flown back to Baton Rouge to stand trial. Gary Plouchet had entered the waiting area of the terminal wearing a hat and sunglasses to conceal his face back when you could fucking not have to go through security to get into the terminal. Gary took a position near the pay phones and made a quick call. As Jeff Doucette was being escorted out of the terminal to wait, uh, to waiting live broadcast news crew, to a waiting live broadcast news crew. Sorry about that. Gary moved a revolver from his boot and shot Jeff Doucette in the fucking head on live TV. The clip can still be found online. Yes, it can. Uh, Gary was arrested on scene saying, if it was your child, what would you do? After a lengthy and public trial, Gary would plead no contest to a charge of manslaughter and receive no jail time. Sentenced to a seven-year suspended sentence and 300 hours of community service, the judge was quoted as saying a prison sentence would be counterproductive. Fuck yeah. Uh, between this case and being a real uh, lifetime to kill and it taking place in my home state, it was one of my favorites. I was a huge fan of your comedy for years and now find myself a space lizard in your ever-growing cult of the curious. Please keep doing what you do and thanks for the laughs, Tyler. Man, we should suck that story someday, Tyler. Woo! Had deja vu watching that video of Gary taking that piece of shit out, uh, but hadn't forgot about it. Man, for so much injustice in this episode, it felt great to uh, cover some justice uh, in that case. Thanks for sending that my way. Uh, I'm glad. I know not everybody agrees with this uh, policy, but I'm glad Jeff was put down. Glad Gary was the one to do it and not sent to prison. If only justice could work out that way. Hail Nimrod. Uh, next up, our first of three D&D messages. Kick-ass nerd sack. John R. writes, Hello, kindly king of the suck. I loved your D&D episode. I've listened to all your episodes. Just makes my workday go faster. I'm proud to admit I'm a nerd. One hell of a sexy nerd who got laid in high school, listened to metal, played D&D, read the Satanic Bible, drove around in a recalled Pinto, and was raised by a single mom. That means I must have sacrificed virgins, drank blood, and am a truly evil person. I work for Bear Evil. Oh, boy. Where I developed a device that makes you shit your pants at the most important and personal events, like weddings, first dates, and honeymoon nights. Roar, motherfucker! Uh, now the truth. I have a great life with a beautiful wife and family. <laughs> I met my friends playing D&D in middle school, and we're still friends. All of my friends are successful and have great lives. We owe some of that to playing D&D where we learn to work together, communicate effectively, learn how to think critically, and grow our imagination and so much more. We still play D&D from time to time. One last thing. The more you give your views on different subjects, the more I think we were separated at birth. I agree with most of them. My mom did tell me she lost her first baby. She told me it would have been a boy. I always wondered if mom was telling me the truth. Keep on sucking. Three out of five stars wouldn't change a thing. Well, Brother John, I love this. Yeah, so much good has come from D&D. It's a beautiful game. Uh, something to be coveted, treasured, not feared. Uh, thanks for sharing that wonderful story, you fellow fucking nerd. Hail Nimrod. Another huge nerd. Marshall Erickson explained something I barely touched on last week, writing, Hail the Suck Dungeon Master. I'm listening to the D&D episode right now and want to give a bit more insight as to what goes on. Most of the games I've been a part of are known uh, as what's called homebrew which you kind of touched on, but didn't really fully explain. Homebrew, and yeah, you're absolutely right. Homebrew is when the DM makes their own stories and scenarios, but the really fun part is when players start making their own characters. Sure, your fir first few playthroughs uh, could be having you be a knight or a paladin or a wizard, but after you've done it a few times, you start to get, well, creative. 
Let me tell you about my last build that was directly ripped off from you in Time Suck. The year was 2020. I was with my then girlfriend, now fiance, congrats. And while we were not newly in a relationship, we were in that stage where you're uh, comfortable with them, but maybe not want to reveal you're full crazy. And while at this time I had fully converted her to being a space lizard, I wasn't ready for her to know all the weird shit I'm into. Well, somehow the topic of D&D came up and much to our surprise, we found out each of us participated in the game. So now with the fear of judgment aside, we embarked on playing a game together with a mix of our friends. I won't bore you with details, but it came time to roll our characters and directly (laughs) ripping you off. I rolled a character named Sir David of Childress. That's awesome. I think you see where this is going. (laughs) My, my character, Sir David, was a druid who could transform into a cryptid. Oh, fuck yeah. But he could not control which cryptid he transformed into. And yes, while I played, I used your voice. Uh, David, had your children. Um, yeah, no, it's fine. No, that's no problem. It was a huge hit and everyone loved it, even though they did not get the reference. Sir David was lawful chaotic, so he wanted to do good, but was just unpredictable. Also, when I rolled for the character, I rolled such a low intelligence <laughs> that the bill was almost unplayable. But I felt that was perfectly fitting for the real life version. Anyway, I hope you get a good laugh out of this. Love the show. Uh, <laughs> what is, uh, uh, and suck on. Live King and suck on, uh, Elam. Well, thank you, Elam. That's so fun. Uh, I love that you did that. I hope you do it more. I, I didn't know the term homebrew was for that. I love it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why, why limit your imagination? Make uh, the D&D world even bigger and more unique to you. Sir David of Childress with a low intelligence score. That sounds awesome. I hope he, uh, hope he didn't die. hope he shows up in more campaigns, but I feel like he probably did die. It sounds like he's not a very solid character for actual gameplay. Uh, one final D&D message from our uh, final fucking nerd this week. Uh, kick-ass sack, Jacob Marsh, who writes, Hail Dan, Suck Meister, all-knowing prophet and Nimrod, and Air Banjo Maestro. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for doing an episode on Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe that sounds weird, but I love D&D. I literally got done playing a game last night, and I appreciate the love you're bringing to one of my favorite hobbies. Also thought you'd like to hear my story about the whole satanic aspect of D&D since you got into it in the episode. Kind of funny and plenty ridiculous. At least to me. I've been playing D&D for about four years now. And I'm just about to graduate high school. Oh, young buck. Uh, one day last year, I was playing with my friends and I wanted to show my girlfriend D&D. And she was excited because she loves um, uh, you know, fantasy books and Lord of the Ring. So we played and she made a character. It was all fun. And then the next morning, I get a call from my girlfriend saying she might not be able to see me anymore depending on what her mother says. I asked, what happened? She said her mom was angry at her for playing the game because it was satanic. I was so confused. The whole three hours was the group arguing about how to make their way up a big tree and talking to a magical horse, which spoke funniest shit I ever came up with in a game, uh, but I digress. Uh, Regardless, I didn't see her for a while and I got really scared. I messed up bad, so I told my mom. My mom laughed when I told her and said that it's fine. It's just a board game. I grew up during all the panic. Her mom didn't. She's just too young to have seen that. So I don't know why she's upset. It's just you and your friends being nerdy. I laughed at that. My mom said she talked to her mom about the whole scenario. I waited a couple of days. You got a good mom. And I thought I'd really messed up. And then I was at school one day and my girlfriend's mom asked to talk to me. She's a teacher. Oh God. She's a teacher and she's afraid of Dindy. That's, that's fucking scary. And uh, she said my mom talked to her. She said that I could still date her daughter, but I was not going to involve her in any of that stuff that she didn't approve of. I was confused, but I didn't argue and I left. Ever since then, I've been able to basically hide that kind of stuff from her mom because I'm worried she'll disapprove. But my girlfriend doesn't care and said, once we go to college, I should teach her how to play again because she thought it was, I love this like fucking Coke or something. Once I get to college, I'll be able to roll those die. (laughs) Once I get to college, I can fucking snort some Coke. Uh, I suppose it all worked out in the end, but frankly, it still frustrates me. Yeah, it should. That I have to wait just to share a hobby with my girlfriend because her mom thinks I'm practicing some occult rituals or something, even though I'm getting confirmed at the Catholic church this year and I go to service every Sunday. I suppose it's not a huge deal. And I know it's going to be even less so as time moves on, especially if she and I are still together. And I know we're still kids, but I really hope we're able to tough it out. To that, I'll give a hail, Lucifina, and thanks uh, for her letting me keep my girlfriend and dumb, nerdy hobbies at once. Definitely don't want her mom to know I said that. Maybe not that I listened to this podcast. She definitely wouldn't approve. But I'll listen regardless, because you bring so much laughter to, me when I'm, laughter to me when I'm down. Praise Bojangles. May he watch over you as you roll those 20-sided die and uh, as you argue with your friends over who should get the weird magic item none of you can use. Oh, Jacob. The fear continues to this day, huh? Wow, crazy shit. I, w- I wish I would, I, w- I want you to send me an email like every year updating your progress in this situation. Like your life. I'm just like, if you do continue to be with this girl, I'm sure she's great. And then I just picture like way going forward, like she's your mother in law. She's going to be a fucking wild ass mother in law. She sounds like a nut. She might be a nice person, but she sounds like a nut. Uh, man, crazy shit. It's a crazy world. I uh, hope her mom wakes up someday and realizes, yeah, it's just harmless fun. Calm down. Calm down, Karen. 
So many fear-based thinkers out there, Jacob. Don't ever become one of them. Don't make life harder than it needs to be. I hope soon you and your girl are going on some fucking awesome campaigns. Maybe David of Childress shows up and you have so much imaginative fun. Maybe you get uh, an Italian paladin. As I roll a pasta linguine and I put the pescatore Antonio Banderas. I just like to say Antonio Banderas, even though I know he says nothing to do with Italian. And you're right. Uh, do not let your mom, her mom find out you listen to this shit. She'll lose her fucking mind. <laughs> and as they say in closing in Italian, Marissa Tome, Rudy Giuliani, meet lovers pizza pie, a princess pizza, fettuccine Lamborghini. And that's all for today. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thank you for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Please don't have anyone arrested based on zero hard evidence and crazy shit that exists only in your head. Please do look for summer camp tickets next week so we can fucking hang out. And the Poconos, do some sucking. You know, bring your fucking D&D campaigns. Why not? Uh, thanks, everybody. Add Magic Productions. Hello, uh, uh, lucky Italian restaurant. My name is Adana Camas. I'm a fluent in Italian. Let me order my uh, food uh, in Italian from uh, Giuseppe Italiano Bistro. Uh, what are you thinking of cannelloni? Uh, the cannelloni, cannel- cannelloni, I call it cannelloni. Some people call it cannoli. It's okay. It's no problem. Uh, it looks like you have an egg and noodle stuffed with a beef. Uh, the veal and chicken, uh, based on a little, little uh, pescatore, stambole, Ferrari, uh, Bugatti. I don't know about that. Uh, maybe I have a chicken and liver. Uh, maybe I have a cup of jelly, a little cream. Maybe I'm speaking a higher voice and I'm going to... Maracari Parmigiano! Uh, I don't know. I think I'm gonna go with the, the Venetian kebab, sir. Uh, charcoal grill kebab, sir. Some of the penne noodles. And a tomato sauce. I want the tomato clues and a pizza. Paprika. Asiago. Pa- Pablo Cruz. Yeah. The Napoli. Yeah. Uh, one more Italian word. A spaghetti. No, I don't like a, a spaghetti. Uh, how about a Koopa Troopa? I have a side of Koopa Troopa. And for the dessert, I have a little bit of Wario. Uh, hasta la vista. I'm pretty sure that it's a Spanish, but it's a pretty close to Italian.